Can you do the opening slides? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's plan on that if I'm this spotty. And Nick, are you able to step in and do uh, the roll call? If it's too spotty, I'll to do it. But are you able to do roll call if I can? And if you're talking to Nick, I can't. Going to Nick. Sorry, I did you say something? I couldn't. Sorry, I was. I had this. I'm having some audio issues on my. So, Jess, was that you saying I could step in and do roll call if I need, or you could step in and do roll call if you needed to? Correct. Okay. All right. I'll give it a whirl. Jess, you're on opening slides. Um, and let's just see how it goes. Yeah. That. You mean Jess or is, Jessica? Is, Jessica is going to do the opening slides. Thank you. Setting the page. And Jess, I will try to do roll call. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to do the roll call, but if it just is sounding bad, bad Jess, or Jess, Mad Jess is going to step in and take over on the roll call. Are we square? Yep. I I thought you called me Bad Jess for a second, but you said Mad. Mad Jess. Hard <laughs> Jess. Oh, I'm the Bad hard Jess. Jess. Come on. I think I'm bad Jess. <laughs> no, it's definitely me. <laughs> okay, so for the opening okay. slides, Stacy, um, let's see. Mm -hmm. So that would be on the run of show, just like the welcome, <coughs> all that stuff. Yep. Okay. Yep. And yes. yeah. Okay. I think I can figure it out. Our, our just mad Jess will share her screen, all that stuff. And if my sound can step in if we need to, you tell me if my sound is good enough right now. It it has its moments where it's good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's reassuring. <laughs> There's just some some spotty spots, and sometimes it starts coming through like all at once. You know. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. Like, <laughs> really It'll come fast. through eventually. All right, so let's just see if I can do it. And Jess, Jessica, nah, Jessica, you just interrupt me if it's just not working and make a decision, okay? Will do. Okay. Hey, everybody else, welcome to the uh, <laughs> Psychedelic Medicine uh, Roadshow here today. Uh, we've got another minute before things get underway. Uh, so go ahead and, you know, check your microphone too because with this thing today, uh, so if you're just feeling like, mm, something's wrong, come on your microphone, test things out because there are plenty of times during our meeting today that we want to have a conversation. And even though we've got space on mural for you to write your you know, that's just never going to be as good as hearing people's voices. So go ahead and give your microphones a chance. Uh, test things out, if you will. Morning, Adam. Hello. Can people hear me? Yeah, yep. we can hear you. All right. Hello. Can you hear me? Sound yeah. as good as yours today. Hey, Paula. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Good morning. Ari, Ari, Donovan. We can. Yay. I should check. Can everyone hear me? You too. Okay. It sounds yep. like all of the technology runs out with me and Nick. All right. Jessica, I'm seeing that it is not, I don't know a quorum yet. Um, quorum, by the way, everyone is 12, 12 members. So we're all frantically counting members to see if we've got members enough. So whoever gets the list first. We have nine right now. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, maybe while we're waiting for people to trickle in, I'm really interested to hear how the psychedelic law boot camp went for the attendees. Yeah, uh, I, um, I don't know if it's on our agenda for today. I don't see it explicitly. It's not. And there's certain aspects of it that we're bound to by confidentiality. Um, oh. So we can like maybe say what happened, but we can't really talk about. Oh, like, 
Oh, oh, there. Oh, oh. Sorry, what was that, Stacy? So let's wait another minute. So just for folks coming online, um, Stacy Shorgan's having some um, technical issues, so I might be popping in a little bit more uh, to facilitate today with some help from Jess and Nick. So we're just waiting to get a quorum. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, yeah, Adam, it was a really, a really interesting meeting. It was quite intense, you know, basically like three full days of interacting with people from various sectors, the pharmaceutical industries, indigenous cultures, um, physicians, drug policy experts, lawyers, you know, it's kind of everyone that's kind of got a, a foot in the game uh, for psychedelic legislation and policy reform and research. And um, it was really, really interesting. And I think it's going to help some of our work in terms of just some of the realities of what's legal, what's being explored. Um, but yeah, I, I, I got a lot out of it. I, I won't speak for Rep Smith or, or Bennett on their experience. I don't know if you guys want to update on, the, on that, <laughs> how you how it was for you while we wait for a quorum. I think that was a good overview. Yeah, there was a it's just a wide swath of sort of the field as a whole, hearing from each individual part, um, like representatives of the FDA um, were there, DEA, and all kinds of discussions about how that looks federally and how states might be involved in that, but also just more broadly what people are doing in the industry. So yeah, I found it really, really helpful. Um, I don't think anything like earth shattering to the point where like, I feel like I have to share this nugget of knowledge that I learned that I didn't have previously, but it was really, really helpful to see the scope of where we're at um, as a field. Yeah. And, you know, I, I found it um, heartening to talk to people um, across all of these different uh, sectors and industries on the, on the regulatory side, on all the different industry sides and the academic sides, and, and really, um, really see that, that, people are are really thinking very hard about a lot of the questions that we're also thinking about um, as a task force. So that was that that was a, a takeaway that that I had that I thought I, I would share. There we're we're not in a locked box working through these um, working through all of these regulatory um, you know legal medical conceptual questions. There's there's a lot of other people who are we're asking the same questions and, and doing a lot of the, you know, sort of similar work to, to what we're doing. So um, it was it was good to sit down with them for for a couple of days and, and see where everybody uh, everybody else is at who's looking at this. Awesome. Thanks. Did you have any follow up questions, Adam? Yeah, just great. I'm so happy that you were all able to attend. And I think it's going to be really good for the state of Minnesota going forward that you were there to gain that knowledge to build those relationships and connections. So 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 happy you were able to go there thank you yeah my pleasure at least it was a great opportunity and one that thankfully was paid for by harvard so that was very nice generous um so welcome everyone we're going to get started on our meeting today now that we have a quorum thank you to um, all of our task force members um government staff joining as well as everyone watching live on youtube um so we ask that if you are able to the best of your ability and comfort level to have your cameras on during this meeting um, also, we ask that um, when we're doing large discussions that you use the hand raise feature so that we can get a cue going so that we don't have folks talking over each other and everyone has their opportunity to speak. Um, we will not be using the chat feature during this meeting, just given open meeting law it, um, guidelines that we sort of need to be having these discussions out in the open, on camera, <laughs> um, on, on microphone. Um, so if we're having kind of side conversations in the chat, that's not visible to the public. So we won't be doing um, chat features to have side conversations. You can um, send messages to the meeting um, facilitators, Jess, and I believe Stacy can receive direct messages if you have logistical questions, um, but try to keep any conversations around what we're working on, um, you know, to conversations that we can have um, for the audience and other members to see. Um, we also encourage everyone to get on Mural and to join as a visitor. There's no need to add any avatar initials, just hover and find the facilitator um, to get started. And so expectations of observers, we want to welcome on behalf of the Minnesota Department of Health staff and the um, MAD staff and the task force chair and vice chair. So um, if you could go to the next slide, Jess. Yeah, so task force leadership. So the MDH staff is Carrie Gloppin, epidemiologist and supervisor of the injury and violence prevention section, and Dr. Caroline Johnson, who's the psychedelic medicine scientific researcher for the task force. Um, myself, the task force chair, my name is Jessica Nielsen, and our vice chair, Bennett Hartz, and working group chair, Paula DeSanto. 
and the MAD staff, Jessica Burke, who's the senior management consultant, Nick Kaur, who's the senior management consultant, and Stacey Shogren, who's also a senior management consultant at MAD. Um, let's see. So this meeting is being live streamed and a summary of the events um, that we talk about. Any voting records will be on the task force website, which is linked here. And just a reminder of our task force charge. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force was established in 2023 to advise the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. For the purposes of this work, psychedelic medicine uh, means MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. Next slide, please. So some of the task force duties that we are charged with addressing are, are several. Uh, the first is to evaluate the scientific research. So this is sort of in two parts. One is to survey the existing studies in the scientific literature on the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelic medicine in the treatment of mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, and any other mental health condition and medical condition for which the psychedelic medicine may provide an effective treatment option. We're also tasked with comparing the efficacy of psychedelic medicines and treating these above described conditions um, with um, existing treatments that might be used um, that are already available and seeing which ones might be better uh, for those specific conditions. Next slide, please. And so other duties that we're charged with addressing um, involve more of things related to um, statutory changes to um, implement the legalization of psychedelic medicine, state and local regulation of psychedelic medicines, and to look into different federal laws, policies, and regulations of psychedelic medicine with a focus on retaining state autonomy to act without conflict conflicting with federal law, including methods to resolve conflicts. Um, and I'll be going over some of these in detail later, um, but there are some specific federal statutes that we've been tasked with exploring and seeing if those would be options for us uh, to use, given that they're all technically federally um, legal under those um, existing statutes and federal law. And then our fourth task is to um, educate the public on the recommendations that we end up making to the legislature um, and others that might be necessary or appropriate actions to take related to the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. Next slide, please. Okay, um, let's see. So I don't know if we're doing the overview yet. Apologies, um, Stacey usually does this part. So I think um, first, next we need to go to a roll call. Um, let's see. So first I'm gonna turn it over to, um, we're gonna do a roll call with, oh, where's that section? So we do actually have a new member today. Um, I wanna turn it over to um, Kari Gloppen um, to give us an update. We do have a new um, member joining us that was just appointed. I'm not sure if they're actually on the call today. Um, this is Senator, um, sorry, <laughs> Senator, Senator Scott. Dibble, he's in the room with Nick. Okay, great. Um, so Carrie, do you wanna come on and, and kind of talk sure. about this new appointment? Yeah, so as you know, um, we lost two of our Senator appointees um, this in the past couple of months. And so we've been working with our MDH um, legislative liaison team to work with the Senate to get two new senators appointed. And so the Senator uh, Minority Leader um, has appointed Senator Scott Dibble from Min Minneapolis um, to the task force. We're still waiting to hear back from the minority leader on that. So we'll let you know when we hear. Um, and I, so I don't know if Senator Dibble is in the room or if he's going back to his office to join, but um, we're really glad. Senator to Dibble just left. He thought the meeting was in person. So he came here in person, but he went back to his office and will join the Zoom shortly. And yeah. maybe he can introduce himself when you see that he joins. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nick, and thank you for that backstory and introduction to, to that. And welcome, Scott, uh, Rep, uh, Senator Scott Dibble. Um, hopefully I'll say it again when you come back on. Um, all right, so let's just go over some sort of high-level um, agenda items today and what we hope to get through. So first, we want to approve the July meeting minutes. Next, we'll um, share out some member-collected feedback. So this is an opportunity for each of our members to report back on any conversations or work that you've done over the past month from your respective uh, community or agency um, that might help our discussions today. Um, then we're gonna go over our kind of decision flow chart and decisions that we've made. I'm gonna do a 
fairly in-depth overview of um, what we've learned so far and how that ties into the legislative duties and um, things that we're supposed to be exploring um, based on the legislative language in, in the task force um, uh, legislation. And then we're going to move on and talk about some additional recommendations that we want to swat today, similar to what we did last month. Um, and then do some grady of agreements to get a consensus because we really want to figure out what's going to be the final recommendations that we actually vote on next month in September. So we want to finalize those discussions around what we are actually going to be putting up to a vote in September. And we also want to make sure that each of you has all of this time between now and September to go back to your communities or your state agencies with this information um, to have a clear sense of how to vote. Um, and we will be sharing out some some one pagers for each recommendation that hopefully will be sort of like an issue brief uh, that you can take to the state agencies to get a sense of hopefully how to vote and weigh, weigh your decisions on those. Um, so once we kind of go through all that, then we're going to do a discussion around what that fighting, final voting process is going to look like in September and the final report production. Um, and so Jess Burke will be going over the voting discussion and Caroline Johnson will talk be talking about um, the logistics of writing the final report. Um, and then we'll do some initial discussions on the public education requirement. Um, and hopefully we'll round out and we'll be able to have some marching orders to do between now and September. All right, um, so let's move on to a roll call to make sure everyone's here. I don't know if Senator Dipple has joined back on yet, but hopefully by the end of roll call, we'll have him back on. Um, so Jess, were you gonna do and the roll Jessica, call? This is yeah. Actually, oh, this is Stacy. Can you? Yeah. How's my? Um, it's cutting out a little bit. This is Stacy talking. Okay. Then, just to make things move along, just our best could grow call that probably best. It looks like we do have quorum even without uh, Senator Dibble here yet, so we should be. Forward. And then we'll go back and grab or Jess Burke, if you could take roll call. So we're not dealing yep. with Stacy's bad time. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, Courtney. Here. Helen is absent. Guthrie. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Paula. Here. Has Senator Dibble joined back in yet? I don't see him. Okay, Jeremy. Didn't see him on the list. Stefan, I also didn't see on the list, but. No, he's not Mark. here today. Let us know he'd be absent. Who did? Stefan. Okay, uh, Margaret. Here. Bennett. Here. Dave is absent. Nick Lennertz. Ari. Here. Jessica. Here. Kit. Here. Jill. Here and good morning. Good morning. Ken. Here. Donovan. Here. Rep Smith. Here. Michael is absent. Adam. Yes, here. Uh, Ronji is absent and Rep West. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jess. All right. Um, all right, so just kind of going back over, I already talked about our, our agenda, so I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're not quite there yet. So now we're gonna go ahead and approve the July meeting minutes. So everyone should have been sent a copy of the meeting minutes from July um, to review. Um, so uh, can I get a motion to approve the July min meeting minutes? This is Bennett, I'll move. All right, thanks, Bennett. Do we have a second? I'll Courtney, second. I'll second. All right, thank you. All right, so a motion, a motion to vote has been approved. Um, is there any discussion that folks want to have about the meeting minutes before we move on to voting? Anything you want to clarify, correct? For whatever reason, I did not 
receive them. I, I think sometimes things get sent to my Hennepin County email address rather than my Gmail address. Would it be possible for someone to send them to my Gmail address? Yeah, at some point? sure. All right, thank you. And I'll be abstaining on the vote because I just haven't had time to look at them. Thank you so much. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and also for anyone that was not at the meeting on in July, um, you are obviously free to abstain since you can't confirm whether the meeting minutes are correct if you weren't attending the meeting. So just keep that in mind. Um, is there any other points of discussion about the meeting minutes before we move on to a roll call by vote? Vote by roll call. Okay, Jess, I'll turn it back over to you to do the vote by roll call. All right, Courtney. Approved. Helen is absent. Guthrie. Uh, approved, sorry. Paula. Approved. Uh, are we still waiting on Senator Double? I guess he'd have to abstain, uh, abstain anyway. Uh, Jeremy is absent. Stefan is absent. Margaret. Approved. Bennett. Yes. Dave is absent. Nick is now running late. Uh, Ari. Abstain. And I just lost my uh, screen, so I don't know if you guys are seeing what I was sharing. Uh, Jessica. Approve. Kit. Approve. Jill. Approve. Ken. Approve. Donovan. Approve. Rep Smith. Approve. Michael is absent. Adam is abstaining. And that's it. I will try to get my screen back so you can see what I'm sharing. Thank you. I can see uh, it looks just like the task force update slide, Jess. And Adam Tomczyk, I just forwarded you the, the main email to your other Gmail account. Thanks for letting us know and reminding us about that. Okay, so next on the agenda, we're gonna move to um, member collected feedback from the public or the agency that you represent. So um, if anyone has had any opportunities to connect with their communities over the past month and wanna report back on that, um, feel free to either raise your hand or come on camera and, and share that with the task force. Thank you. Yeah, Paula? Or is that a clapping or hand raising? That's a raising my hand, yes. Um, okay. I did have a chance to uh, have a Zoom meeting with Dr. Joseph Lee from Hazelden. Um, he shared that uh, he's following the research. He finds it very promising, uh, definitely worth continuing to track um, and continue to expand research opportunities. He wants to be uh, clear that uh, he was speaking both for, as an addiction um a medical provider, but also wanted to kind of kind of go on the record that Hazelden as an organization absolutely supports uh, strategies that embrace harm reduction, motivational interviewing, and they are not pur puritanical and uh, will absolutely not turn away science. Uh, he has significant concerns related to um, what might be driving a lot of the research and where things go uh, related to commercialism, capitalism, and business opportunities. And so I think that is a big fear of his that, that 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 really will be more the driver than maybe um, more uh, therapeutic or clinical considerations. Um, he's a little bit concerned about the hype, how it might be having an impact on youth. Uh, while serotonin is not chemically addictive and really habit forming in, in the sense of these the medicines that we're referencing here, uh, he has, has some concerns about uh, people being addicted to the experiences um, and how that uh, can kind of view their perceptions of reality or how they maybe are interfacing in terms of kind of um, their their narrative. And so that was more his concern around the kind of addictive nature of the, of, of the psychedelic medicines. Um, and also has some opportunities to uh, talk and uh, interface with people that are out there practicing, uh, offering um, spiritual sacraments through uh, church, uh, churches, a 5013 church, and also some folks that are doing some um, offerings through individual practices, all of which seem to have more kind of uh, therapeutic, uh, healing, uh, relational uh, kind of opportunity. Um, not None of it was really recreational. There, there was all kind of a, a healing intention. Uh, some concerns came up around uh, how do we help people to prepare? 
Are we helping, um, you know, are we, are we screening and ensuring that people that are accessing some of the, these opportunities for healing um, are kind of ready? And, and then how, do we, how are they held through that, that healing process? And is there enough support in, in the integration? And so a lot of really active conversations around preparation, uh, facilitation, integration, and, and where there might be kind of some, some needs for, for uh, help. So um, a lot of experiential and a lot of conversations, a very dynamic um, process you know, I'm engaged in right now. Thank you for that update, Paula, and for reaching out to the communities. Okay. Hey, good, good morning, everybody. Um, so earlier in July, I hosted a webinar with uh, Susan Bolio as the the speaker. Um, thanks to everybody who was you know who attended. I I thought it was was wonderful. Um, oftentimes, kind of oddly enough, when when I'm in those situations, sort of facilitating, I catch less of the content um, as you're sort of just doing the technical things in the background. Um, we did happen to send out surveys. To follow up, I uh, got close to 40 responses from the surveys. Uh, about one quarter of the surveys were Native American. I can say um, overall the interest in the topic and the interest in um, that webinar was by far the, the most attended webinar that we've had um, with about 120 unique individuals attending. So I could say that there's a pretty good representation um, within, within sort of the size that was there. Uh, I can send on the survey information to you, Jess, if you'd like to see it. Um, but really what comes up in the information that we got back from folks. So it's a closed session just for those who weren't there. Um, the talker, uh, the speaker gets to talk and then respond to questions at the end. Um, so there wasn't much interaction opportunities within the hour that we had. Um, everything was overwhelmingly positive within within the feedback there was one response that had some skepticism of making this more widely available there was also some uh, comments and feedback in there about uh, sort of inclusionary um, efforts for native people to be involved with distribution practice guided um, things like that so um, the where folks wanted to kind of go from there um, and what else would be helpful to know? I think that there was sort of this it's so new that we're not sure what we need to know yet um, theme coming through there. Um, but I think it was a good first step to to get some info out to Native communities, both locally around the country. So that's about it. Thank you so much, Guthrie, for doing that. All right, Courtney? Hi, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I was is a meeting with a group of um, trauma-informed therapists and uh, having a discussion around uh, um, kind of expanding the conversation. I know we talk a lot about veterans with PTSD and we were specifically talking about how some of the research um, lacks, but also that psychedelics might be helpful for people such as police officers, um, firefighters and uh, first responders. And so I think Sometimes the conversation um, lacks that thought, but it could be really helpful for um, those groups of people as well. Thank you, Courtney. All right, is there any other um, feedback from various communities that folks want to share at this time? Yeah, Donovan? I'm not finding the raise your hand button on mine, so I just raised my hand. Um, this previous month, uh, I did a lot of research with uh, people that are in the chemical health field and in the mental health capacity uh, field that um, work with our populations. And the consensus I gained from working and talking with them were, it it is like I think Guthrie mentioned, uh, they don't know what they would like to be educated on except for how would this help. And, you know, it is new it is something different and as i keep pushing the alternative ways of healing through natural plant medicine that message um there is a lot of interest in healing the deeper sense of mental health when it be, when it comes to addiction so as we're thinking about that and how does that look and how does it feel and what would it what would work it is really coming up with a way to broaden our ability to do these educational um 
seminars or sessions or something to that capacity. Thank you, Guthrie, for lining that up and doing that. I wasn't able to attend, but it sounds like it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, and as we're looking forward and we're thinking whatever this means towards what we're working as a group for uh, the future of this, I think it's evident that it is helpful. It's just how can we help others understand the helpfulness and the healing component. So uh, I think I spoke with probably 36 people in the industry of chemical health from three different reservations and uh, in the field. So it was, it was pretty interesting to, it's, we don't know and we'd like to know more. So there, there's some other um, opportunities to definitely reach out, do some education. And there was, I think there was about a handful of people that went to a mental health conference over in, I think it was Leech Lake. And they heard Susan give us speaking over there. And they were so like a light bulb and like, oh my gosh, we need to know more. And how do we, like, how can this work? So it was really promising. And yes, there's some skepticism. There's going to be always the, um, we don't really know and we don't, and, but if it's another way of healing, that's kind of what we hope to push is the knowledge on how it can be so helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donovan. All right, do any other members have anything they want to share before we move on? Yeah, Margaret? Um, well, I didn't have an actual listening session over this last month, but I wanted to piggyback on something Courtney raised because my primary population is working with first responders with post-traumatic stress. And a conversation I have over and over with one-offs as they kind of find out the, about this task force or my involvement, um, they kind of pull me secretly aside and ask. Um, and one of their concerns is because their regulars, at least for fire, who have very, very, very high rates of post-traumatic stress and suicidal ideation, um, they are regulated federally about what substances they can use. So they feel like their hands are tied and a lot of conversation I have, well, I'll do that when I retire because right now I'll, my job's at risk, so I can't. So from a clinician point of view, it's very frustrating when there might be something to be helpful, but they're federally regulated, so they can't use substances that might benefit their, their trauma and stress. So. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Margaret. I think that highlights the broader issue of, yeah, like federal employees in general and federal institutions within states that might be pushing this. And what does that do to job security and access to benefits and things like that? So thank you for bringing that up. All right. Any other feedback from folks? I do want to just give a, a, a chance for our newest member, Scott uh, Senator Scott Dipple, to, to come on. Camera, if you want to introduce yourself uh, to the rest of the task force members, we're really excited that you were able to join our task force. So welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my apologies for being late today. I actually went over to Centennial. I didn't realize this was primarily as I didn't, it was communicated to me, but I didn't quite catch that. So I apologize for my tardiness, but I'm uh, really happy and pleased to be a part of this task force, even though I'm jumping in quite late. It looks like we're getting rolling on, on uh, starting to draft the report. So I'm uh, busy catching up with all of the past uh, slideshows and and studies and research reports and uh, and minutes getting up to speed, but I'm very, very interested in this subject. Uh, Representative Smith recruited me to it, but um, um, he might have done so because I was the, the chief author of the medical cannabis bill back in the day um, and continue to have an abiding interest in uh, looking at some of these alternatives that have been previously excluded uh, from inclusion as possibly helping people. So really happy to be a part of the conversation and look forward to rolling up my sleeves and uh, hopefully making a positive contribution. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you so much, Senator Dipple, for joining us and for your enthusiasm and engagement. 
Um, so hopefully um, this next section of the meeting will hope to give bring everyone up to speed, including you, Senator Dipple, around kind of where we've where we've been, what have we learned, how does that fit into what we're actually charged with doing with the psychedelic task force and what's written in the legislation and what comes next in our um, sort of next steps of voting and writing the final report. All right. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is just the very, and again, all of this is also on mural and they were also sent as a PDF um, to your email. Um, but briefly, this is kind of this very high level, very busy uh, flow chart of kind of how we've been moving through our work uh, since we had our first meeting in November and kind of where we're at. So uh, next slide. Just wanna orient everyone to kind of this part of the flow chart that we're in now. Um, so between J July and August, which obviously this month is August, is we're distilling all the information that we've learned from all the research and education that we've been doing around these complex issues, um, their legal status, what are they doing in other states, bringing that all together to, um, to figure out what is the best path forward for Minnesota and what do we actually want to recommend in our final report. So this meeting today is kind of going to be our last major decision making meeting to evaluate everything before we actually vote on our recommendations um, in September so we can actually start drafting the report. Um, and this, the final report is due to the legislature on January 1st. So we will need to have it done quite a ways before then because the different agencies need to be able to review the report, provide their feedback, um, and then it needs to get finalized and put into a proper report, report format. And then there needs to also be some time if anyone wants to turn it into a bill uh, for the 2025 session. So we need to kind of accommodate all of that in the fall. Um, so next slide, please. All right, so I'm just gonna do a really high level overview of kind of what we've learned month by month. Um, so, you know, we met, first met in November and we, you know, kind of went over the ground rules and then we elected um, the task force chair, which is myself to kind of get things moving. And then in December, we kind of had our first set of, of presentations and started to really learn about what, what it is that we're doing. And so that included a brief introduction to how clinical trials work, how the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA approves new drugs coming through the pipeline and some special considerations that have had to been de be developed by the Food and Drug Administration specifically to deal with how to measure efficacy, which is testing a drug compared to a placebo um, or inactive drug um, to determine whether it should be approved. Um, and there's just some sort of special methodological things that need to be factored in given the unique nature of how psychedelics work. Then in January, we had um, we started kind of talking to our first group of lawyers that were really helping us try to understand the legal realities of what we're doing. Um, so we learned from Robert Rush and Ishmael Ali about the history of drug prohibition, how the Controlled Substances Act came to be formed, and sort of this new concept of sort of states as labs that we're seeing popping up around um, psychedelic legislation and drug policy reform, where really every state is sort of experimenting with drug policy, knowing that at the end of the day, everything that's being discussed um, in each of these states is federally illegal. Um, and so states are trying to kind of innovate and experiment with changing things at the local level. Obviously, there's been precedent with this with all the cannabis legalization that's happened both medically and recreationally. Um, but psychedelics don't, I think, have the wide public adoption that cannabis has had. So we're sort of in a weird space as a state trying to figure out what our own lab is going to look like in this in this sort of process and trying to learn from what others, others are doing and what sort of is legal and what's not legal. In February, we learned from um, Mason Marks, who's both a medical doctor and a lawyer that has been thinking a lot about um, psychedelics and psychedelic law. Um, and he gave us kind of a rundown of the realities of some of the federal laws we're, we're tackled, we're, we're um, tasked with addressing in terms of how can we, we create a program in Minnesota that is federally legal um, and kind of giving us some kind of ground truth realities of what's going on with um, the bills that were passed in Oregon and Colorado and how some of what they're doing could potentially run afoul of federal issues regarding data privacy and blending psilocybin or psychedelic services with schedule, um, sorry, blending healthcare services with schedule one drugs um, into potentially federally supported um, healthcare systems. And then also kind of initially discussing the fact that decriminalization is the simplest option to implement some of these things. It's basically just not enforcing a federal law. Um, so legally, financially, that might be an easier option, um, comes with some other issues that we'll get into in a minute. Um, 
And they're basically saying that the only things that are technically federally legal right now are more clinical trials, which already have a, a process to do that is legal that a lot of people are already doing, including in Minnesota, as well as it's not illegal to educate the public on harm reduction and safety around um, these substances. Um, so then in March, we moved on and had some, um, we learned about cultural genocide from plant medicines and practices from Christine and DC McCleave and sort of the long history of how kind of the westernized world has at first demonized, demonized indigenous practices with um, sacred plant medicines like psilocybin and specifically in this country, peyote. I know we're not tasked with doing that, but that is kind of a similar serotonergic plant medicine that is now federally protected for members of registered tribes in the United States. Um, even though for a long time that was sort of um, attempted to be um, kind of bred out of people and um, it was this kind of cultural genocide that is now kind of coming back online and people are trying to now restore these rights, even though there's this long history of cultural appropriation and genocide. Um, we also heard from Ariel Clark, um, who was talking about the, the need for proper tribal consultation on these issues, as well as ethical guidelines for businesses with psychedelics, um, basically from lessons learned from the cannabis space and kind of some pitfalls that have happened in that arena, um, especially when it comes to um, tribal consultation around those issues. Um, next slide, please. So then in April, we um, heard from another lawyer, Shane Pennington, about um, how state regulated medical programs may help build support for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, to recommend federally rescheduling psilocybin. Um, this was recently done with cannabis. Um, which was kind of a big shakeup in the system where there was sort of this process where unless a drug product or, or a substance went through the whole FDA approval process through clinical trials, that was the only way to really reschedule something. Whereas now because of all these state medical programs with cannabis, um, that the federal government has sort of viewed differently what is accepted medical use um, sort of given that. So the argument is that if there was more intentionally developed medical programs in each state with something like psilocybin, that might feed into this larger conversation. Um, but we kind of aren't sure whether, you know, is that our job as a task force to try to change the national conversation versus trying to create something more equitable and accessible within Minnesota? Um, and then we also had the first kind of rundown from Caroline Johnson about some of the clinical trials with LSD and where we're at with that. Um, and knowing that um, the federal government, the FDA, did grant breakthrough therapy designation to LSD for uh, generalized anxiety disorder, which is going to start phase three clinical trials later this year. In May, we had a panel of experts. Uh, we brought back Mason Marks, um, our kind of like federal legal expert, uh, Jason Ortiz, Emma Knighton from Oregon, and Dominic Mendiola from Colorado. And they talked to us about regulating for equity, um, talking about issues around criminal justice reform, community investment, and economic opportunity. The fact that decriminalization must come before or along with any legalization that happens, not afterwards. Um, talking about some lessons learned and growing pains out of Oregon and Colorado, including uh, the need to involve state licensing boards from the beginning so that clinicians that want to be facilitators can um, pursue dual licensure without risking their, their job as their therapist hat uh, by their my medical licensing board or other licensing board. Um, also having more flexibility for allowed uh, facilitation locations to help with accessibility and costs. So in Oregon, they were kind of restricting to these service centers, but that posed sort of an equity issue for people with disabilities that would prefer to do it at home or people that want to do it outdoors. Um, barriers to access were cited regarding costs for both the facilitators, which can include startup fees, tax code issues, licenses, as well as for the clients that want to um, pursue these um, services, and that included limited accessibility, payment for things out of pocket, which are kind of skyrocketing in cost. And it also has created a tourist industry in Oregon, and it's mostly serving people coming from out of state that are very wealthy rather than people that actually live in Oregon. Um, and also requiring the program to fund itself sounds like it was a problematic thing um, that is actually causing um, fees to be driven across the, por the board for e either people wanting to get licenses to facilitate or people wanting to access services. It seems having that sort of cash-based self-funding model was really one of the significant drivers of driving up the cost. And we've been cautioned to find other ways of funding this um, if that's the route we choose. And we also, again, heard... Um, Caroline Johnson, again, presenting clinical trials, um, focusing on synthetic psilocybin, where we saw that there was some evidence um, showing some promise. Again, psilocybin has also been given breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA for um, two different conditions, major, major depressive disorder and treatment-resistant depression, which are both currently in phase three clinical trials. 
All right, in June, we learned from representatives from Lycos Therapeutics about the development of MDMA-assisted therapy and what that rollout might look like if FDA approves it in August. And then Caroline Johnson presented clinical trial results um, with MDMA along that vein. And again, MDMA was another one of these drugs that was given breakthrough therapy status by the FDA for treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. The phase three trials started around um, 2017 is when they started working the FDA on their special protocol assessment. And then they submitted their new drug application at the end of 2023. And we should have an answer by August 11th uh, from the FDA on whether they will approve it or require additional testing. Next slide, please. So I just wanna highlight um, some realities of kind of the evolving nature of what's going on in this space um, nationally. Um, so it's been interesting doing this work over the last few months because it seems like a lot of fundamentals have been changing as we've been trying to do this work that have made it kind of interesting and either difficult or, or easier depending on how you look at it. Um, but some kind of notable things that have happened that impact some of the conversations around our work is first this thing I hinted around around the HHS, which is kind of, you know, the, the larger branch of the Food and Drug Administration, um, modified the way they consider accepted medical use when making rescheduling recommendations to the Drug Enforcement Agency or the DEA. And so they recommended scheduling cannabis to schedule three due to accepted medical use across many states and not because of FDA approval of a specific product, which is the traditional way that it's been done. Um, the day after we had Lycos representatives meeting with us to talk about their drug approval process, there was an FDA advisory um, committee that met, which is sort of an independent group of clinicians and other folks in the space in the pharmaceutical industry who theoretically should have no idea what's going on with the trial or the new drug application they're evaluating. And they look at all the information and provide a recommendation to the FDA on whether they would vote to approve it or not. And they voted basically nine to two against approving MDMA based on the evidence presented in the new drug application. Um, so that's not a binding decision. It's just a recommendation. Um, we still don't know <laughs> how the FDA will rule on this. So we'll just wait and see. And so after August 11th, we'll have a little bit more clear understanding of what that's gonna look like and how that impacts our work. So stay tuned for that. Um, and then the next thing that's sort of more broad reaching and it's unclear what this will do to impact us directly, but it does have some implications for some of the federal pathways that we're tasked with exploring. So there's this thing called the Chevron Accord that kind of has been something in place for like 40 years um, that was able to allow deference to be given to certain federal agencies when there's some ambiguity in the way that the law is written on how to enforce it. Um, and so this was recently overturned by the Supreme Court um, just a few weeks ago. And so this may enable more successful litigation of cases with the DEA around right to try or religious use access for psychedelic medicines. Previous attempts for um, Controlled Substances Act exemptions to access things like psilocybin under the Right to Try Act have been rejected due to deference to the DEA on whether the Right to Try applies to Schedule One drugs. Um, they say no. Um, many churches have also been denied exemptions for similar restrictions with the CSA. There have been some successes, but it's not clear. <laughs> you know, there's not. It's not straightforward on how you actually get one of these exemptions um, successfully. Um, so it's kind of a big open-ended question on how these things will impact drug policy moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I just kind of want to bring it all together and just the ground truth reality of what is legal, um, given that these are the explicit federal pathways that we've been tasked with exploring and whether they're feasible and whether any programs that we're recommending um, would be putting us in the federal crosshairs um, under some of these things. And also adding a few different ones that kind of have come through our conversations from talking to other states and subject matter experts in the field around drug policy reform and harm reduction to inc include some other options to explore, including state approved medical and or adult regulated use and decriminalization along with these um, other federal programs. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of go through these one by one and just kind of talk about what are they and, and kind of how does that fit into what we're talking about. So the first one that was in um, our legislative duties was to explore seeking an administrative exemption to the Federal Controlled Substances Act under US Code Title 21, Section 822D and Code Federal Regulations Title 21, 
blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is a federally legal program um, where you basically submit a request to the Drug Enforcement Agency to allow the use of a specific controlled substance for some compelling reason, um, which is up to the discretion of the agency to decide whether to grant an exemption. And so this, so from my perspective, as somebody that's doing kind of schedule one research, I had to do something similar where I applied for a license from the DEA so that I could give people psilocybin in a controlled setting. Um, and there's all these exemptions and restrictions and protocols that are, are needed to be done to make sure that you're accounting for everything. You're not diverting the substance to other people. And so under programs where you're asking for one of these exemptions, it's typically that you have to create a lot of documentation around what you're doing with the controlled substance. And so this is heavily documented and regulated in research context, but there are other ways that people could um, try to get one of these exemptions from the DEA. Um, so... Um, this is also the way that churches will apply for religious exemption um, for, for the CSA by invoking the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act right and also their kind of First Amendment right to um, freedom of religion um, and exercising their religion. Um, and so that is seen under a broad part of this specific statute, 1307, that refers to the use of peyote with the Native American church. The other option, and so that's just basically asking the DEA to give you an exemption and hoping that they say yes and you provide some, whatever information they want. The other option, which is the most more commonly um, more commonly used method, is having to seek a judicially created exemption to the federal CSA, which usually involves having to go to court and suing the DEA because they did something <laughs> to an organization that prevented them from using um, the substance that's being enforced under the Controlled Substances Act. Um, so, for example, the Supreme Court um, or a district court could try could do this. Um, so, several psychedelic churches have attempted this route with mixed success. The most recent is the Church of the Eagle and the Condor, and the and this was the very the third group in the United States to be granted exemption um, under this Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, with um, a controlled substance. Um, in this instance, the three churches that have been granted religious exemption are using something called ayahuasca, which we're not tasked with exploring, but that has a longstanding um, use in various religious communities, mostly in South America, but there are there are a few legal churches in the United States that are allowed to use this and have exemption from the DEA to use it as their sacrament. Um, so, but there have been other churches that have also tried to go this route, sue the DEA, and then been denied. And the denials either come from an explicit letter of denial, or they just sort of let the thing sit in the courts and don't ever address it. And it kind of just they wait, like I think I heard someone saying they've been waiting like eight months or eight years rather for a response from the DEA. Um, so that's a whole other option, but it is something that can be explored. Um, when we had Mason Marks come and talk to us, he said that this is something we could potentially do if, for example, we tried to give people in the state access under our own state right to try. And if the DEA were to get involved, we could then take them to court and ask for exemption. It's almost like you have to prove that there's some kind of government action that's preventing you from doing something, and then you have to litigate it in court to get your exemption. So it's a bit more of a process, and it does require people basically documenting all their illegal activity and then submitting it to the DEA to decide whether they can do it or not. So it's a it's pretty risky, um, but it is one of the options that people could explore. Okay, next slide, please. All right, the next thing is to petition the United States Attorney Attorney General to establish a research program under US Code Title 21, Section 872. Okay, so what this is, is this is a, another program that was recommended to us by um, our a lawyer, subject matter expert, Shane Pennington. Um, and this is something where you create sort of a state federal relationship where we could create a research program that is legal in the federal government's eyes that kind of functions like a clinical trial. And this was actually the program that initially um, seeded methadone clinics because methadone clinics were initially being explored back in the early 70s, right when the Controlled Substances Act um, was was enacted and enforced and um, methadone, they were still trying to figure out if it had any medical potential. So they sort of kept it in this like research class and created this whole federal research program to give people access to methadone in clinics across the country, but under this sort of like research hat where one of the concerns around some of these state medical programs and issues around federal protections is that if you're doing something that is federally illegal, things like patient confidentiality are not covered. So the clinics in Oregon or Colorado, if they're collecting data on people that are engaging in illegal activity, that information could be subpoenaed by the federal government. And then you don't have confidentiality and that sort of privacy aspect that puts people at risk for a variety of reasons. And so under the research umbrella, 
you do have those federal protections and those privacy protections, and it's run similar to a clinical trial. The argument is that why not just do clinical trials? What do we get from this type of a program that's different than just your standard run of the mill um, clinical trials? So it's unclear whether this could be an option, but that sort of is something that is still a law that is possible to explore. It's just unclear. I haven't been able to find any other instances of this program being used in the United States. Um, so we don't really know. So it'll be interesting to see if this is actually something that we could do um, or explore as a state. Um, the next option is the um, FDA's expanded access program. Again, this is federally legal, but this is essentially, again, the same thing as a clinical trial. And it depends on a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company being willing to authorize a physician to give the drug to a patient. It's decided on a case-by-case -case basis. And not all pharmaceutical companies um, offer an expanded access program. Expanded access trials must be approved by the FDA and registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so again, that's an option for access. It's very limited access, and it really is up to the discretion of the pharmaceutical company and whether they actually want to provide that access to people outside of the scope of their clinical trial and their new drug application. Um, the last one that we were tasked with ex to explore was the um, Right to Try Act. So I hinted at what this was earlier. So in theory, this should be a right for everyone in the United States to be able to access experimental medications currently showing promise in clinical trials. So again, this is a decision between a physician and their patient and shouldn't involve asking the government for permission. However, when it comes to Schedule One drugs, such as psychedelic medicines, the DEA has rejected all requests for access under Right to Try because they say it doesn't apply to Schedule One drugs. So this may be another pathway that becomes more accessible since the Chevron Accord was overturned, but we don't really know what that's going to look like. And the, the state of Minnesota has its own Right to Try Act that doesn't explicitly say that um, Schedule One drugs are excluded, but it is excluded. It only includes people with a terminal illness. So people basically in hospice, I believe, are the only ones eligible for that under Minnesota state law. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's some other options we're looking at. So the state regulated medical program, potentially like what Oregon and Colorado have been trying to develop. Um, so again, this is not federally legal. It doesn't come with any federal protections. Um, and is kind of one of these states as labs types of programs. So states have done this for medical cannabis regarding existing legal pathways for such a program to exist. But with the added factor that medical programs with psychedelics are also including facilitation by another person that also needs to be regulated. Um, there's a lot more complicated things than just sort of piggybacking on how a medical cannabis program came together. This does have a chance of running afoul with the FDA. If clinics are advertising services and making medical claims, um, such as psil psilocybin treats depression, when FDA has not approved that. Um, so that is something where they could potentially get involved and send like a cease and desist, cease and desist letter um, if you're advertising with medical claims. Um, Oregon's program is sort of doing this by trying to completely separate their service centers from any kind of healthcare um, so that they're not getting into this issue of, of making medical claims that haven't been proven. Um, but it's also keeping licensed health professionals from using their clinical skills during these facilitation sessions in order to separate that. And, and you know, this is kind of a problem when it comes to a harm reduction perspective, that even if somebody's not having a serious issue, if there needs to be crisis intervention or trauma-informed care and the facilitators aren't able to use that, that could be a problem. So the dual licensure is really important. And that's something that Colorado is trying to do. And they're kind of, they have a whole different program Um going where they are, um, you know, they've obviously had cannabis and more like kind of a, an adult use program um, in Colorado. And, um, but psychedelics don't kind of have that same widespread approval as cannabis does. Um, so having dispensaries with mushrooms is maybe a little too far off. So what Colorado has done is they've had more of a, a medical system that has dual licensure. So there are people able to go and see a clinician and do it kind of under that healthcare umbrella, but they also have sort of non-clinical facilitators that they're allowing to be licensed by the state and allowing people, and they also decriminalize a lot of natural psychedelics so that people could either engage in that sort of more healthcare setting, or they could grow at home and do it in community in sort of a non-clinical setting, which kind of broadens access um, and is seen in general to be more of a, you know, like a better way to um, have equitable access that people can use on their own terms. It's more culturally relevant. Um, but all of that, again, is federally illegal, and they're sort of <laughs> experimenting with whether this is going to be okay and if the feds ever want to crack down on this. Um, 
Yeah. So it's unclear if we can just completely piggyback on cannabis um, rules around medical programs. And so while what Oregon and Colorado are doing is is useful, I don't know that it's necessarily the best model that we we want to use in this state. So I think we need to keep in mind, like, what are we comfortable with in terms of the federal legal situation and what gives the most access to people in Minnesota? Next slide, please. Okay, and then there's this option of decriminalization. So this isn't really federally legal or not legal. Um, we heard from Mason Marks, given the fact that states can invoke the 10th Amendment and states' rights, they're not they're not required to enforce federal laws. Um, so this is one of them where it's not creating anything new. It's just saying don't enforce this law. Um, so that seems to be pretty straightforward, but there are some issues when it comes to psychedelics around education and harm reduction that um, I think we should talk about. But in general, the most broad consensus across the board is that decriminalization is the easiest thing to implement. It's the most equitable. It gives people access on their own terms and it doesn't harm people for simply possessing and using controlled substances. And both the American Medical Association and the Minnesota Medical Association have come out and officially endorsed decriminalization of possession of all drugs uh, to be more of a public health issue and that it should, that should be the route to go to help improve public safety and stop criminalizing people for using and possessing controlled substances. All right, and the last option um, is religious use. And so baked into a lot of the conversations that we've had is the sort of undeniable reality that there is a heavy spiritual mystical component to psychedelic experiences. It's why they're revered as sacraments in indigenous communities for thousands of years throughout the world. Um, so I think we need to keep that in mind. And there are a lot of churches popping up that are claiming religious freedom. Uh, to use different psychedelic drugs and just kind of praying that the government will not intervene and um, prosecute their religious practice. Um, so this is kind of a gray area where technically I think everyone should be protected, um, but whether an individual county or prosecutor wants wants to enforce that, depending on whether someone believes that they have a sincere, sincere religious practice and whether they can use controlled substances to engage in that practice, I think Again, theoretically, it should be protected, but we see enforcement of this acting out very differently, depending on the church and whoever's bringing that request for religious protection. So just want to keep that in mind in our conversations around this. So I think that's all I have so far. There might be one more slide. Right. Oh, so this is the big one, tribal sovereignty. So throughout this, we need to be talking about making sure that any any new laws that we might recommend are impacting existing tribal sovereignty. So there's 11 tribal nations within the state of Minnesota, where all but two of them, which are Red Lake and Boise Fort, are subject to something called Public Law 280, which allows state and local law enforcement to have jurisdiction over criminal activity on tribal lands. Tribes, tribes are allowed to make decisions in enforcement of civil matters, but state and county can intervene on criminal matters. Red Lake and Boise Fort are the only, are only um, subjected to federal jurisdiction um, when it comes to criminal activity. And um, we should be doing ongoing consultation with tribal governments and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council as new legislation is explored and implemented. Alexa, to ensure pause. I'm going to make your, because I'm going to, I'm on a meeting. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so as new legislation is being explored and implemented, we need to ensure that the proper language and protections of tribal sovereignty is written into that. Um, and so um, the one of the lawyers at MIAC has agreed to help with us in our report writing to make sure that we're using the right language in any, um, any recommendations that we're putting forth. And I just want to thank both Guthrie and Donovan for connecting us with some tribal lawyers. Donovan, Ted Johnson was super helpful. Thank you for having him come to our working group. And then Guthrie brought in, we had a meeting with the lawyer from Maya, Brandon Alkiri, um, which was really, really helpful. So I just want to give a shout out to all of all of that for, for bringing that into our report writing. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next thing we need to really be thinking about as a task force is, and this is one of our duties, is what are the statutory changes, like Minnesota state statute? What are the changes needed in order to implement some of these things? So I've kind of broken it down. And, and this is stuff that the working group is going to have to figure out. And we're going to be talking about this over the next few months of like, what, what are these statutes? So the big one, obviously, is the State's Controlled Substances Act. So this is Chapter 152. Um, and so this is something that we're going to need to figure out, you know, like, for example, if we do decriminalization, 
there's going to need to be language around enforcement um, of various activities related to these three psychedelic medicines, um, whether we remove criminal penalties for certain behaviors. There's an option to deschedule. Descheduling obviously would potentially create the Wild West if there's absolutely no control um, over certain substances. So there's sort of different ways to think about what statutory changes need to happen to implement something like decriminalization. For doing more clinical trials, um, this is federally legal, but extremely expensive, but there's already a pathway for this. There's clinical trials already happening in the state. There isn't really any legislation or statutory changes needed to implement this. Um, it would just be creating some kind of program to help fund it. Um, in terms of a state medical program, so changes in state statute could occur that allow for this under the state CSA. Um, adopting language from the medical cannabis program, perhaps. I think that's also baked into the chapter uh, 152. Um, again, I was talking about this United States Attorney General program that might just be something a little bit different. Um, it's unclear, but that wouldn't necessarily be a change in the state statute. It's more kind of creating a relationship with the federal government to do a research program. We potentially could amend the Right to Try Act for the state to broaden it to more palliative care, not just end of life. Um, to be able to allow Schedule One substances on the state CSA, that's a pot potential option we can discuss. And then for adult regulated use, again, it's under Chapter 152 um, and potentially, again, Chapter 342 from the Medical Cannabis Program. Again, these are just suggestions I want people to be thinking about kind of what, what these mean and what changes we could be making. Uh, next slide. And this is the last one before we open it up to discussion. So I just want to talk about kind of what are some state and local regulations that could um, occur under each of these potential umbrellas. So it's decriminalization. Obviously, we need to talk about public safety and education, first responder education and training, regulations to prevent commercial manufacturing and sales um, under existing drug laws. Um, under the umbrella of more research and clinical trials, um, this may involve creating or adding to existing grant programs through the Minnesota Department of Health, allocating funding for eligible investigator-initiated clinical trials. This is like the one I did at the University of Minnesota where I have an idea and I want to test it. Um, and, you know, this kind of requires people to be credentialed and that they have some degree that allows them the kind of competence to run a clinical trial. And then you have to go through all these approval processes to be able to do this, but it is possible. It's just very expensive. Um, for a state medical program, we would need to work with the dual licensure for licensed professionals, regulations of psychedelic medicine supply, training and licensing facilitators, safety monitoring, and adverse event reporting, incentives for equity licenses and business startups to reduce barriers to entry, things like that. Um, for potential adult regulated use space, allowing for the legacy market, such as the existing underground market to move into a state legal regulated space, incentives for equity licenses and business startup. And then for religious use, you know, if that's something we, we think might be worth exploring, we might want to explore the intersection of compelling government interest. So this is like if the government feels that they can enforce a law that is a enough of a compelling government interest to supersede some other right that someone has, um, then, then they could enforce that. So we just need to figure out where the boundaries of that are in Minnesota around the Controlled Substances Act and what would actually be protected under religious freedom. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I know that was a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, breathing, drinking from the fire hose a little bit, but I really just wanted to give us a hopefully comprehensive rundown from my perspective of what we've learned, where we are, and where we need to go, and what is the work that we still need to do. So I want to leave it open for some discussion right now before we take a break and move on to kind of talking about another recommendation that we want to swat. Um, so questions, thoughts? Yeah, Adam. First of all, that was an amazing summary, Jessica, demonstrating uh, a great amount of medical knowledge, scientific knowledge, understanding of administrative law. So I'm very, very impressed. And it was excellent. Thank you. Uh, the one thing I wanted to jump in and add uh, with regard to some of the various conversations we've had with the lawyers, at one point, we did have a bit of a debate between Shane Pennington and Mason Marks at one of our working groups. And Shane Pennington, as you noted, was pushing for more of the federal Title 21 Section 872E plan, which was what the federal government did with the methadone programs in the roughly 1980s, getting a lot of data, building data, finding out, oh, this is effective, rolling them out. It was a multi-decade process to get where we are. Um, and I, my point is, I jumped in as a representative of 
patients with treatment resistant mental health problems, um, of which there are four of us on this task force, two veterans, two non-veterans. And the question is, Shane, what about people who are drinking themselves to death right now? What about people who are addicted to opiates? What about people who are on the verge of suicide? Like, what is the quickest way to get them relief? And he was emphatic in that the, if that's your concern, the quickest way to do it is move toward decriminalization and eventually adult regulated use to not go through this long, complicated federal process. So I just wanted to put that out there. And that's where I my heart is at. And that's where my vote is at starting with decriminalization specifically for um, naturally grown psilocybin mushrooms uh, and eventually moving into the world of adult regulated use for these so that these various substances, which are sacred, which are ancient, are not tied up in um, too much medical regulation uh, that would ultimately create large expanse and barriers to entry, barriers to access for people. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? I'll let your hand raise or are you clapping? Yeah, no, sorry, it's my hand. I guess maybe it looks like I'm clapping. Um, you know, you mentioned Colorado, and I, uh, my understanding is they're doing kind of a, a, a the decrim combined with adult regulated use bowls. And other than being in conflict with federal law, which is not a, a small thing, is a, what? Why would that not be a, a, an approach to try to replicate here? Well, it, it might be an approach that we want to replicate here. I think that's what we need to decide. Um, I think the the information coming out is just you know the the and we really only have information from Oregon because Colorado hasn't actually started anything other than now that they have decriminalization there's sort of more of this community use that's happening that's kind of taken off without much incident and from a public safety perspective that I can understand um but what's happening in Oregon is that the you know the sort of very tightly regulated system where they can only go to a specific center and they have to you know engage with a specific person and there's only one specific supply that ends up driving the costs up and it makes it really hard for people to get in to the point where we're seeing that it's just a tourist industry now. And it's not actually happening, helping anyone in the state by and large, because it's just too expensive. And they're starting to see these costs kind of building in Colorado as they're making their rules mm -hmm. and seeing like this might there might be some problems here. Like this might be too restrictive, you know, it's like, we want to create this safe, accessible program, but in, in putting all this extra stuff on top of it, that we're not sure is even necessary. It's creating so many extra barriers to something that's already inaccessible and, and also making it really expensive and committing cultural appropriation. And there's just all kinds of stuff that it seems fraught with that it's a way forward. I just don't know that it is the best way forward. <laughs> Um, and that's just sort of my kind of cursory high level opinion based on what I've seen and what we've learned from the people doing that in those states. It's unclear what that would look like in Minnesota. So I'm like, I feel like we should be open to whatever we think is best and what do we think is going to broaden access in the most equitable way possible for people here. I don't know if that answered your question. It does. Thank you. Yeah, Bennett. Um, another thing I, I'd like to just, um, you know, keep in mind, it's it's something we've kind of talked around or talked about is um, the fact that this is a very uh, dynamic question that we're trying to answer, questions that we're trying to answer. Um, the, uh, the medical and legal framework um, around these questions has changed even over the course of this task force as other states um, like Utah have taken action in this space that that's created ideas that I don't think we would have thought of um, had Utah not implemented it. So um, one thing that I think we should be thinking about as we are actually writing the report, and I, I don't think this pertains to our, our questions we'll be voting on since those are very concrete, but in general with the report, I think it would behoove us to, you know, remember that this is something where we don't need to pick the final version of what these laws 
should look like in Minnesota in 2024 and 2025, I think we should be also letting the legislature know to, you know, keep in, what do they say, watch this space, um, so to speak, uh, look, look at, look and learn from, from other states and other countries into the future. And, and that should be sort of an explicit part of our, our recommendation too. like, here are our recommendations for right now, based on the best information we have, but we are cognizant that that information is changing quickly and our recommendations might, you know, might be out of date in three years or in five years. So that, that's something I, I just wanted to be sure we, um, we all have space to to think about and talk about. Yeah, thank you for naming that, Bennett. Um, I think that's an important point around, I think a lot of like what Colorado did was they passed their bill, but then they created working groups to to help with the rulemaking so that it would roll out with, with a lot more buy-in from the stakeholders that would be affected. So that could be something where it's like, there's like a plan, right? A, a recommendation for a plan of how this could get rolled out rather than trying to have all the rules in the report, which I don't think we can predict how the future's gonna go, so. And, and Representative Smith has has mentioned this several times, um, which is that the, you know our laws around regulating consumption of alcohol, which is you know has been around for hundred plus years, are, are change every year um, as as the market changes, as science changes, as other things in the political landscape change. The legislature is going to go back and and change, change, change every year. And, and we should expect that to be part of the process. Um, not a, you know, a, a feature, not a bug of regulating, um, any kind of mind altering substance. Thanks, Bennett. All right. Any other thoughts before we take a break? Questions? Topics we're not dealing with? I just want to echo what Adam said, Jessica, amazing summary. I mean, so helpful. Thank you for bringing this together. Thank you. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> Senator Dipple, do you have any questions kind of getting brought up to speed on all this work? Sorry, couldn't find my cursor there. Um, nope, just soaking it all in. Appreciate right. it. Appreciate the uh, overview and summary too as well. I'll echo that. Thanks. Okay, well, I guess we'll we'll stop now for a break, um, and then we'll we'll do a little ten minute break. We'll come back at ten fifty three. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, doing a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis of one final recommendation. And then we'll open up the discussion around any other things you think that we need to potentially SWAT and bring to a formal vote next month. So maybe just keep that in your mind as we have our little bit of break and come back here at 11, uh, sorry, 1053. <laughs> Thanks. And Jessica or Jess, this is Stacy. Could just somebody tell me if my audio is working? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Small miracles. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jessica. What changed? Went out for the fourth time and came back in. Fourth time is the charm. That's what I know today. Awesome. Good to have well, you. I don't know why you even need me here today, Jessica, because you're doing a bang up job. So. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's been a little, it's hard to do all of it. <laughs> and like pay attention to other things going on. Yeah. Well, hopefully I'm here to help you out from here on out. So I appreciated Guthrie naming that with his event of just like when you're trying to do all this facilitation, you might miss like conversations. Yeah. Are happening yeah. In yep. Uh, one last thing, Jessica, I'm assuming that you're going to go through the slides with the recommendation presentation and discussion, those those final three summary of mural activities from past meetings? Correct, yeah. So I'm gonna kind of okay. take as the last thing to swat, of like how did we get here okay. and why are we swatting this additional yep. thing? Okay, very good, thank you. So if everyone can hear my voice, this is Jessica. We got about one more minute left to come back and resume the task force meeting. You are again co-host, Stacy. Thank you, Jess. And Jessica, are you ready to go ahead and get started again?
Yep. All right. So we're at 10.53. So we're back from our 10 minute break. Thank you everyone for joining and for the YouTubers for watching. So now we're going to move on to the next section of our agenda. So we're going to talk about kind of how the different recommendations that we're discussing came to be <laughs> and um, what kind of the results were of some of the consensus that we were trying to get around some of these recommendations. And then we're going to do one additional SWOT and then potentially open it up um, if there's other topics that folks want to bring up for an official vote in September. Because um, we want to make sure that what we're voting on is very high level. And then the details of how those might be implemented will be um, sort of decided in the report writing and people can weigh in during that. And we'll hear more about that from Caroline later around how the logistics of the report will go. But let's sort of get a sense of kind of what the recommendations are that we're talking about um, and kind of what has been the general consensus about those thus far. Um, so can you go to the next slide, please? <coughs> Should be 114, Jess. Yeah. All right, next one. So this is um, this is a slide that's trying to quantify some of the mural activity we've done each month, um, specifically around the research that Caroline Johnson has presented. So in April, May, and June, we heard um, presentations around kind of what are, what is the evidence from the clinical trials with MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. Um, and kind of what do we think about that? And after each presentation, we would do these mural activities of sort of like, do you recommend LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, yes or no? And if yes, under what conditions? If no, you know, what are some other things? And so this is sort of just trying to get a sense of like, how are people feeling in general about the kind of clinical trial evidence? So on the left histogram, um, basically have these blocked by on the y-axis, the number of task force members that voted or, or responded with that answer of yes or no, if they recommended it in general, um, and whether it was LSD, psilocybin, or MDMA with the green bars being those that said yes, they would recommend it, and the white ones being no, they would not recommend it. So, you know, at the end of June, we had sort of more approval uh, of, of recommending MDMA than the other drugs, uh, with some mixture of, you know, everyone who chimed in about psilocybin saying, yes, they would recommend it. And was kind of a mixture of LSD and MDMA um, showing support for, for recommendation. So next in terms of sort of like the context with which some of these might be recommended in kind of maybe that more medical, non-medical or other setting, you know, we said like, if they did recommend it, would you want it to be within a medical only setting, non-medical, or should we do more research? And again, kind of a mixed bag um, where we see, you know, a lot of people having a lot more endorsement and support for psilocybin, um, except for when it comes to doing more research um, and just trying to figure out, you know, do we want something that is restricted to specific medical conditions or something outside of the medical? So there's kind of a mixed bag on that of like what that would actually look like to implement um, and what restrictions would be put around that. Um, and the next is just sort of like, you know, was there any within sort of like the medical, do we want to restrict it to specific conditions? So we have in the legislation written, you know, to explore things like PTSD and depression, but there's a lot of other conditions that have some evidence, uh, maybe not in the full phase three randomized controlled clinical trial stage yet, but some promising evidence emerging in both clinical and non-clinical uses um, to suggest that maybe restricting it to specific conditions might be a little too um, cumbersome when we're still not really sure what these things might be useful for other than what's kind of been tested in clinical trials. So that's kind of an open-ended question, but it seems most people in general don't want to restrict it um, to medical conditions um, at that point. Next slide, please. So next was trying to figure out, you know, in July, we did kind of like a litmus test of, okay, of the different flavors of recommendations that seem to be, you know, blubbing up in the various conversations we've had, both in the previous task force meetings and in mural. And at the, I think this was in June that we did a kind of very high level um, assessment of how people think about decriminalization, doing more research, having a state medical program, or just sort of a more broad adult use program. And again, this is blocked by each substance, uh, psychedelic medicine that we're looking at with MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin, those three being the synthetic versions of those psychedelic medicines, and then adding an additional category for psilocybin containing mushrooms, uh, just given that they're easier to produce, cultivate, and use and potentially a little bit safer than the synthetic versions that require a lot of chemistry uh, that is just a lot more difficult for your average person to source. Um, so um, there seem to be 
pretty broad approval for decriminalization, a lot more so with mushrooms. Um, there seemed to be across the board support for more research and a bit of a mixed bag when it came to a medical program um, and pretty much not a whole lot of, of endorsement of support for an adult use program with the exception of um, psilocybin containing mushrooms. Um, so given that kind of information and seeing this level of you know, support for or against um, some of these potential high level recommendations that we would wanna vote on, um, it seemed that the first three decriminalization, more research and a state medical program had the broadest consensus to potentially move forward and discuss. So next slide. So this is the results from our, our gradients of agreement from last month when we when we swatted these three level high level recommendations and trying to get a sense of, you know, is this going to be viable and remembering that when we come to vote next month, we're going to want to have a, a super majority. So a two thirds um, vote of a yes would be needed to pass these things. And just one thing to note, I noticed that the state medical sort of gradients of agreement shifted a little bit to be a little bit more uh, favorable towards a state medical program across the board than it did when we did this kind of first look back in June, uh, potentially because we swatted it and we kind of talked about all the perceived strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats, and maybe some people's fear, fears or concerns were alleviated through that process. We didn't see much of a shift on more research. And again, seemingly there was still quite broad support for decriminalization. Uh, so the thing that's still missing that we still need to talk about is the adult regulated use of mushrooms, even though it didn't have wide support. Um, we know that the other three substances definitely didn't have support in terms of creating a, a, a system in our state to synthesize LSD and MDMA. Like that's from every lawyer we've talked to is just not a viable option legally in any capacity. Um, and so to keep kind of the synthetics within the, the, the medical field, um, and maybe the clinical trial research space um, and waiting for FDA approval, whereas there might be something different going on with um, psilocybin containing mushrooms that are easier to source and grow and kind of keep within this sort of closed loop within the state system to keep us out of federal crosshairs. Um, but it has a lot of, I think, um, issues around it that people have expressed. Um, and so I think this is something that we should we should be swatting right now just for the comprehensiveness of our report. This came up in the working group of really wanting to get the data around what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of that type of a program just for the comprehensiveness of our report and why that recommendation may or may not be explored um, for the report. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the kind of thing we're going to do, if you recall from last month, and for those of you that weren't in attendance last month, we're going to head over to Mural, and we're going to do this, this SWOT analysis of this specific recommendation. So just to remind people back last month, for those not familiar with the SWOT or didn't do it last month, the SWOT is a way to basically evaluate a new idea and whether somebody wants to adopt it or not. And so we're going to do this use in the business world. You try to evaluate as a group, what are the perceived strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of that idea. And you don't want to think of like a, an opportunity being the complete inverse of a, of a threat, right? They should be distinctly different. And the idea is to hopefully make threats into opportunities and weaknesses into strengths. Um, and then once we kind of go through and, and put all of our feedback into the boxes for this specific question of adult regulated use of psilocybin mushrooms, um, then we'll have a discussion about it. And then we'll do what's called a gradients of agreement where it's not an official vote, but it's just sort of get a, a, get a sense of where you land within the spectrum of this being a yes or a no vote officially. Um, so whether you love it, like it, or can live with it, and those are things that would suggest that we might be amenable to moving forward with this as a recommendation versus the leery of it and loathe it options, which would suggest this is a no vote for you potentially. And if that's your answer, then we would ask that you put in some sticky notes underneath each of those to kind of justify what is it about it that you're leery of or loathe um, and what would potentially be needed to get you to be more accepting of it. <laughs> um, Stacey, did I miss anything in that description or, or orienting folks to mural? Nope, uh, we're good. I just want to do a shout out to Senator Dibble. I know this is your first time probably on mural. So if this is not your jam today, if you're just completely overwhelmed because you've already been drinking from the information fire hose, just tell me what, just send me a message or what I, I will post it for you. Okay. No worries there. No worries. 
uh, but I do need to move my little blue dot I was demonstrating and I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't get to vote. So I'm moving that away. Uh, I think you're good, Jessica. Okay. Any questions about this before we move on to swatting? Again, this is going to be like a mural activity that we can sit in silence, but people are free to come on camera and ask any questions about this recommendation. Otherwise, you can put your sticky notes in the boxes. Stacey, um, I think uh -huh. there's where the box, I'm, I'm noticing that the stickies are disappearing into the box. I think there might be like a, they need to yep. be. Yep. Or Hang on a second. So everybody, I'm going to just unlock the box for a second. I need to unlock it and then send it to the back. Um, there you go. Unlock it again. Now everything that's there should appear, but test it out. If it's not working, let me know. Thank you. Uh, I, and I will remind everybody, if you're operating down on the ingredients of agreement, reminder, if you're voting with your dot uh, as a leery of the recommendation uh, or loathing to go ahead and grab a rectangle bl uh, blue um, sticky and tell us why. And if there's a tweak on the recommendation that would at least get you up to the live with it stage, that would be useful too. So don't just put your dot in there if you're thinking leery or loath. Tell us why down below. And Jessica, this is Stacy down below on the gradients agreement. What we're looking for, I believe, is 14 dots some way, somehow, so that we know all of the members have weighed in. Yeah, that tracks. That makes sense. Okay.
and this is Stacy, a message to members. If you haven't popped in your blue dot down on the gradients of agreement, we're hoping that we can get all members, if possible, to weigh in on our gradient scale, love, like, live with, leery, or loathe. If you're leering or loathing, <laughs> we'd like to know what it is that's concerning you. Uh, perhaps if there's a way to tweak the recommendation to at least get you up to a, a live with vote, that would be helpful. And Senator Dibble, don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm here to help you out if you're running out with with uh, mural tech issues. So uh, don't don't hesitate to reach out if you need some help or want me to put your votes or dots in. Or any other members for that matter. If you're operating from your phone, for example, it's harder to participate. So don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of the other MAD team members. And Jessica, this is Stacy. It looks like it's slowed down enough up in the SWAT area. And the last of the members are putting in their um, dot votes down on the gradient. So might be ready to pivot here and debrief with the group. Yeah. Maybe all but one. I think we have 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good, a good turnout. So... All right, so we have some information now on this one. It seems to have shifted slightly from the initial ping of it. Um, so it'll be interesting to digest some of the uh, strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats. I do want to kind of open this up for discussion if anyone has any thoughts or themes that they're seeing from, from the SWAT that they want to come on camera and talk about. Uh, while we're kind of finishing up, I might just say the interesting thing is I'm reading a lot of this and thank you everyone for the feedback to this is obviously a larger question uh, is not just if we would have this, but if it would be a well-regulated system or not as well-regulated system, which is a separate question than if we're going to do it at all. But a lot of the like concerns people have rightly, um, such as like no support, um, you know, federal crackdown or risks of where the whether there'd be a, a backlash or not commercialization monopolies all that kind of stuff like are very legitimate um but it, it it's kind of a, a tough thing to talk about when we're talking about a system without having a system of if we had a good system we could you know uh, avoid some of those difficulties but not having a system it's obviously something we have to think about so i think just a, a uh i think it's worth saying that some of these questions are also like what is a good regulated system versus just are we going to have one? Which I think everyone knows, but I think as I'm reading through this, it's a very interesting additive question that's hard to answer at this point. Yeah, those are good points, Rob Smith. Thank you. Ari, and then Adam. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to add that, like, from like thinking about what the role of government and public health is, like, this is just so squarely, I think, in the realm of what governments are supposed to do to regulate dangerous activities. You know, it's like cars and seat belts. It's like riding a bike and having a helmet. I think that there's like a land in which there's no regulation at all. And then there's a land where there's like way too much regulation. And somewhere in the middle, I think, is this sweet spot that Representative Smith is talking about where the government is protecting against things that are 
overly harmful. We also don't want complete regulation from the free market where you have just like one monopoly controlling the whole thing. Um, so I would just encourage folks to think about it like tobacco or something where it's like, it's an activity that people are engaging in um, where, you know, there's some things that the government can do to encourage it. Actually, I don't want to think about tobacco because it, it like, it also gets into sacred products. I want to think, let's go back to motorcycles or bikes or something like that, where there's an activity that people are engaging in um, and you, and government can provide some support, like by making it legal, bringing it out from underground um, and making it safer um, for folks to participate in without like cracking down on them or putting them in prison if they don't comply. Forget everything about tobacco and other secret medicines. I take all that back and have nothing to say about it. Thank you, Ari. Adam? Thank you. Um, I, uh, I appreciate Ari's point. You know, I would, I would mention alcohol as another regulated substance. And if you could pick one drug to make legal, alcohol might be the worst one in terms of, you know, responsible for half of all murders, almost all domestic violence, countless DWIs. It's just, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible substance and it's widely available um, all over the place. You know, so I, I get the concern from some of the people who who are concerned about the lack of like clear parameters, clear regulation. I'm assuming that this process that we're talking about would involve testing of the mushrooms to verify they are this mushroom, they're specifically this particular strain. They contain this percentage of psilocybin by volume. Uh, and they weigh this much, which is very similar to what the Office of Cannabis Management will be rolling out and what's how cannabis is already regulated in other states. So um, we do this with other drugs that people take, other mood altering substances, and some of them are very lethal. You know, you could sit down with a handle of vodka and kill yourself in two hours. Uh, that's how deadly it is. No known lethal dose for psilocybin mushrooms by comparison. Um, and I'll also make the point to the people who legitimately raise the threats or the weaknesses that this conflicts with federal prohibition. There's the possibility of a federal crackdown targeting Minnesota. That is correct. Um, and that's true of everything we're doing here. Like we are on the cutting edge of using these prohibited substances that have been prohibited since the 1970s for really spurious reasons. When you look back originally, why were these prohibited by Richard Nixon in 1970? Straight up racist reasons, reasons connected to the Vietnam War, um, that and that shut down medical research for a good 40 years. So now we're getting back to where we were in the 1950s and 1960s, testing these medicines and finding that they're extremely effective. So I, I understand the concern about the you know, potential federal crackdown. That's a, a founded concern, but, but everything we're doing here uh, runs that risk. Whatever, whatever we're doing um, is butting up against um, existing federal law. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Paula? Um, I guess I would just say, I want to echo what Representative Smith was saying that, you know, there, there it could be a good program regulating and um, it doesn't necessarily have to be overcomplicated or too expensive, um, similar maybe to what's happening in Colorado. And I think that the idea that knowing that there is access to a safe supply and facilitators that that have some capacity to help people navigate you know their decision making around it and preparation and 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 you know guidance and then you know integration i just think there's a lot of vulnerable folks that are and, and a lot of suffering there's just people that are really hurting that are, are seeking seeking help and and with with some good good guidance and care they can have it and and it just seems like a 
a good option. You know, I think I think the idea of trying to do some adult regulated program in in conjunction with with DCRIM um, offers options at broad access and also safe containers for people that might need it. Thanks, Paula. Any other discussions on this specific recommendation? I also want folks to think about any other high level questions that you think we should be bringing to a vote next month. Um, and if that's the case, we should probably evaluate it through something similar like this. Is there anything else that we want to bring to a vote next month that we might be missing? Yeah, Paula? Um, you know, the, I appreciate the handout you gave us about the, the, the shortcomings of the scientific literature. Um, you know, I, I don't, it was a, in the, there were a lot of attachments and they were all really valuable. But I, I think more conversation about that in terms of, you know, do we want to do some kind of a, a, a study with the U.S. government around, um, you know, research that doesn't involve all the barriers regarding the blinding and, you know, and maybe maybe looking at lower dose use of psychoactive agents or lower dose or short, shorter acting, because I think there's a lot that can be done around the value of, of medicine without necessarily the, 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 the way that the clinical trials are currently structured. And, and I, I don't, we haven't talked a lot about that, but I think there's huge opportunity that we could lead the way. Yeah, thanks, Paula. So what would be kind of the broad question that might be a recommendation in that? Um, I, I guess if the task force is open to, um, you know, really maybe moving forward with, uh, 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 I don't know, some just some kind of conversation around alternative ways to look at how um, the psycho psychoactive benefits of these of this medicine can be used and studied in ways differently that address all the barriers to the current research. Um, and again, whether it's you know, short shorter acting medicine, lower dosing, but there's so many problems with the research and its generalizability into um, the medical community. So uh, that's not a question, but it's a, a statement of the problem, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do others have thoughts about this? Refining it. Uh, I might add on there. Sorry, I'm having trouble. I have too many windows open right now. That's why that was that long pause. Um, just to piggyback on that, I do think it'd be interesting to include a discussion or a vote on the actual um, state and federal synergy with potentially the uh, attorney general's office, the federal attorney general's office that was uh, Shane Pennington recommended. Um, I've read uh, just one time over the article he read about this, and it is an interesting sort of unique creative approach that hasn't been tried yet. And I'd be curious. It also depends, of course, who is in that office by the time we offer these recommendations. But that I think is at least something we should uh, encourage people to maybe read that article and see if that's something we want to recommend the legislature to do. Um, Cause it, it seems to me an, at least something that is worth consideration. Yeah. Thanks. I think um, so you're touching on this federal program and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Does anyone else on this call understand what this research program is or how the methadone clinics came to be? Um, cause I'm wondering if it's one of those things where it functionally might operate like a clinical trial, but it might have less restrictions on inclusion of medical conditions that you could enroll for, which might get to the more broad access. And I don't know if it requires a placebo or if you're just seeing how does this work in a more ecologically valid setting and how it would actually be adopted in broader clinical settings. Right. So I actually have no idea how this program even works other than kind of its use. So I think there's just a lot of unknowns there, and I think it creates this more federal protection, but then it's the question of how long would it take for that to get implemented is like, I don't even know what that would look like. And if we should coordinate with other states, you know, I think these are the kind of high level questions I'm thinking of regarding that specific pathway and not finding any other examples of it being successful. And I think that's why, so we hear Mason Mark saying this is kind of not really a useful option to explore, just do a clinical trial and Shane Pennington saying, this is the way to actually get that federal protection and change the national conversation around federal rescheduling. So it's interesting. Yeah. And of course, we, we just don't know if um, the, the federal government is going to want to create this sort of program, right? That's something we can't know. I think I'm attracted to it. Uh, uh, I see Paul's hand is up, so I'll be quick. Um, 
I'm attracted to it because I think we're pretty unified on our task force that we would love to see more research done in this space. But also, uh, just uh, to be, I think, frank, I think we don't have the pockets at a state level um, to really impact the field meaningfully in helpful studies. But if we are able to use our influence as a state government to petition the federal government to do more, um, rather than create our own um, studies, I think that could be potentially more meaningful in the overall field of getting drugs to people who need, who could potentially uh, be helped by these substances. So um, both this as well as maybe an official uh, letter to our congressional and legislative delegation asking them to put pressure on DEA and FDA. Those sort of things I think are, are more attractive and more cost efficient than like if we were to try recommend, you know, $2 million every year be given to a certain thing for research in Minnesota. Um, that's just kind of where I'm at currently, which is why I'm attracted to that particular option. Yeah. Paula? Well, and, and I think when we were having the Shane Mason, uh, you know, kind of dialogue there, there was almost this like it's either or, and I don't see it as either or. We, you know, we can pursue our recommendations or whether it's about regular abuse and decrim and, um, and, and looking at this idea of some kind of a medical partnership with the feds. And maybe we could have Shane come back to a work group or if, you know, I would be willing to try to do what I can to learn as much as I can before we come back together as a work group. But I, I think we obviously need more information and maybe we could see if Shane would be willing to come back to one of our groups. Yeah, I will just say, I do know that Shane is not available to us anymore. He's not allowed to provide any more free legal counsel. Uh, so if we want to pay him, he's more than happy to help us, you know, really, really work this out. So if we decide to pursue this program, I feel like that might be something we have to write into a future bill. Um, Could we get that article sent to us again? I, I have lost track of that one, the one that Rep Smith was referencing. Maybe yeah, I don't think it was sent with all the materials. I think I just sent it to Bennett and Rep Smith after our conversations in, in Boston. Um, but I will email that to everyone. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, I was just going to ask for the article too. If that could go around, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. I So I'm not, so I want to be mindful of time. So we have about an hour left. And I'm wondering if this is something that we might want to take to the working group uh, to kind of work out the details more. Because um, I do want to get, get on to talking about um, kind of the process and the logistics of voting next month and report writing. Um, and if we have time at the end, maybe we can circle back to this and decide um, what we, but I want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time. So um, if there's no objections to moving forward or additional things around the adult regulated use of psilocybin mushrooms, um, we can move on. Okay, then I guess I'll turn it over to Jess Burke, who's going to talk about what's going to happen in terms of logistics of final voting next month. And take it away, Jess. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, let me get to my slides here. If I can find them in this list. Okay, so we're going to start voting next month on the recommendations that we have so far. Um, so that would be at our um, September 9th meeting. Um, we're going to use a supermajority to determine whether or not the recommendations um, will pass. Um, we'll have a yes, no, or abstain option for each one. Um, you know, we'd really love to have everyone at the meeting, um, but, you know, we understand folks might not be able to make it. So if you're not able to attend, we're going to ask folks to let the planning team know as soon as possible. So we consider, so we can consider alternate voting options. Um, you know, we might use Microsoft forms. We might just use email. Um, you know, it kind of depends on how many people are going to be absent, how detailed the recommendations might be, but we'll have other options um, if people aren't able to attend the meeting and vote um, in person. Go ahead, Bennett. Um, I just want to uh, break the bubble. I will be out of the next, um, next uh, task force meeting, so I'll need some other way to vote other than in person. All right. Well, we will, and the, the planning team will discuss that and figure out, um, you know, what might be the best way to get everyone's votes. You know, it'll, because when we do it 
in the meeting live, it'll be a roll call. So your name will have to be associated with your vote, um, which, you know, folks don't always follow the instructions on a Microsoft form. So we, you know, we might have to do email just so we know who it's coming from. Um, but again, we'll, we'll figure that out in the planning team discussions as we lead up to the next meeting. Um, you know, as we're, as we're talking, uh, just right now, you know, there, there might be additional recommendations that come up, um, either, you know, come out of this meeting, like we're, you know, just talking about a couple minutes ago, or, um, come up in the report writing process. Um, if they're, if they rise to the level of, you know, like a major recommendation, like, like we've been talking about this meeting in the previous meeting, um, you'll have an opportunity to vote on them. Um, the, you know, we still have, you know, we have our timeline for the report writing, um, but that's a process. So we'll be able to, you know, slot in new information if we, if we get it, you know, and there's all the stuff happening in the background uh, at the federal level with all, with some of these drugs. So, you know, like it's going to be a process as we're writing the report um, and then, you know, finalizing these recommendation votes. Um, very importantly, if you have a constituency to report back to, um, state agencies, other communities, um, of course you have been, you've been keeping your folks up to date um, through this whole process, but make sure your constituencies know that you need this, you need their input if you do need it before the September task force meeting. Um, it's probably not a great idea to, you know, spring it on, um, Bring it on folks at the last minute because there might be you know some uh you know some discussion that you need to have uh and when we're voting um you'll have you know if there if there are major changes to the recommendations that folks want to make in the voting process we'll probably have to go back to the working groups um or to the you know the folks who are writing the report to to kind of tweak them if it's really minor language, we can probably do it in the meeting. Um, you know, if it's, if the vote is, I'll vote yes, if we change this wording, we can do that, you know, live in the meeting as it's going on. But otherwise, um, you know, we might have to send things back to work groups or to, you know, the small groups of folks who are going to be writing a report. And I think that's it for me. Um, any questions on that? Um, <clears throat> just this is Stacy. I'll just underscore for those agency reps the power of going back <clears throat> and using this mural if you're having to catch your your I'll call it a delegation uh, uh, up to speed because we've got so many good slides in here, particularly those today that recapped so much of the information. So default back to this space if you're needing to do some more education with those that you're working with in your agencies. And we also did send, um, it doesn't include today's SWOT analysis or anything, but you did get a list um, in a Word document, in a PDF now for you, um, of everything from the mural, the strengths, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for each of the recommendations that we discussed last month. So if you know, if looking at it on mural doesn't work for you, you've got that, you know, that kind of standard document list that might be helpful to look at it a different way. Yeah, and I do want to point out, and Bennett and I have been talking about this, about putting together like a uh, summary or issue summaries around each of the recommendations and questions that kind of is like a one pager for each question that has all the information that hopefully you can take to the agency or your community uh, with that to, to help inform your decision and your vote. That's a lot of stuff, and I want to create something a little bit easier to digest <laughs> for each person. I think that I would find that very helpful, and uh, along with the specific wording of each recommendation, so we can pass it on as well. That would be a big help. Yeah, thanks. I can pass it to Caroline if there's no more uh, discussion on that. Yeah, thanks, Jess. All right, great. So as we're kind of thinking about these final decisions, <clears throat> I know it seems early, but we really also need to start thinking about the final report. Um, so this is going to be a small 
hopefully very quick PSA just to get the ball rolling. Um, so next slide, please. So even though the report will be officially submitted by January 1st, um, it has to go through the Department of Health and the Governor's Office communications teams uh, to check for formatting and accessibility um, and things like that. With the end of the year holidays, we've been encouraged to have that report given to those agencies really no later than early November so that there's time to review it and send it back with any changes we might need to make. Um, and so with that in mind, kind of a tentative timeline looks something like this. Um, I've broken it down into what can be going on at each meeting um, and what can be ongoing during the month. Um, so quickly, you know, at this meeting, obviously we've continued to work through the process. And then with the rest of August, we'll just continue thinking about the recommendations. Um, and to reiterate, representatives of the state agencies and community seats um, really can and should be discussing them with their constituencies. Um, so then at the September meeting, we will decide upon those high level recommendations to include in the final report. Um, and then during September, uh, we'll really dive into writing kind of a comprehensive draft of those high level recommendations with the aim of those being, you know, kind of fairly filled in by the October meeting where then the whole task force could discuss the report progress, uh, provide feedback, you know, suggest any other recommendations that may have come up during that time. Um, and then with the rest of October, really just continue writing both the high level and maybe some of those lower level recommendations. Um, so then at the November meeting, you know, we can aim to approve kind of a mostly final version of the draft. And then in early November, submit it to those agencies, but also keep working on the language of the draft. Um, and then at the December meeting, pending any feedback, you know, we'll discuss any edits we may need to make. Otherwise, just keep working to make sure everyone's on board um, for this final version. And then we'll kind of make this final submission probably towards the mid to end of December so that it is in for January 1st. Uh, next slide, please. So with that timeline in mind, we've started an initial draft of the report. Um, it's currently in the Teams folder. It wasn't set out with the meeting materials because it's both, at the same time, kind of a semi-empty draft, but also fairly long already. Um, so the pathway to access that is shown here um, on the top left, if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, but if you have any problems with Teams access, just let us know. So there's kind of a couple of notes just to keep in mind about this draft that is, as it is right now. Um, these were sent out with the meeting materials, but I'll just go over them again. Um, so first of all, really everything in here can be considered placeholders. Um, so for me personally, it's always easier to write when something's already on the page. Um, so that was kind of the intent of getting this set up. But do, as we get into it, feel free to, to change, move, add, delete anything that you want. Um, another note is that right now, any text that you see that's in italics is just really notes or context about the section. Um, so the, that will not be staying in the report. I've also left comments throughout and we encourage members as we get into it to kind of do the same and leave those um, comments on the side as we get into it. Um, so on the right here is kind of like a high level overview of how it's formatted right now with just the main sections, um, but there are subheaders for most of these. I think a lot of these sections are probably self-explanatory um, but for now, I really want to point out three in particular. And so first is this community research section. So this is one of the documents uh, sent out to everyone for this meeting. And it's an overview of some data outside of the RCTs. So it includes population statistics, um, poison control information, things like that. We won't really have time to discuss it today, but I really do encourage everyone to look through it. Um, and this is also a place in the report that can house other data from you know, any state agencies or community sources that the task force wants to include. Um, so in that case, please start thinking about if you as your seat representative have any other data you'd like to include. Um, and another thing to kind of think about is if we would like to include the same sort of population data about alcohol and cannabis as a comparison. 
you know, either in this section or as an appendix. Um, the next thing to note is the section for recommendations. So when you're looking at this draft right now, each and every one of the recommendations we discussed at the July meeting is included as its own kind of subsection, but that's with the understanding that some, you know, some of those recommendations will be removed and some may be added. Again, this is just kind of a starting template, um, but in my mind for this section, it made sense to kind of get into our detailed plan for each recommendation here. But again, you know, if that doesn't make sense to you guys as the task force, feel free to change that. Um, and finally, an option for one of the appendices um, can be personal anecdotes. Um, so let's move on to the next slide, please. So something um, that we really want to encourage is if anybody is interested in providing a personal narrative with your thoughts, you know, either in support or dissent around psychedelic medicine, you know, to start drafting, you know, maybe a paragraph or so, aiming to have that finished around mid-September. Um, and this can also include anecdotes from those that you represent. Again, you know, this is your report. So whatever you think is important to include is fair game. Um, related to this, you know, there's also the option to include an appendix providing any context around the votes that we give. Um, so for example, you know, if one of the state agencies were to vote no or to abstain from a recommendation, you know, they could include kind of a short commentary with context around that um, if, if the task force thinks that's useful. So again, there's really tons of um, options for what to include in these appendices um, and, and in the report in general. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So now is probably really a good time to start thinking and discussing how you want this writing process to look. Um, we have set up on the mural um, in the bottom left, it's section three. Maybe if you could move to that, Jess. Sorry. So down here, you know, on, on the mural, we have an activity or at least some boxes. Um, for anybody who would be interested in volunteering to help write these recommendations, um, because there's a lot of them, uh, anybody who might be interested in reviewing them after they're written, um, or, you know, if you're interested in both, feel free to volunteer for both. Um, so please feel free to move a sticky, create a sticky um, with your name on it in either or both boxes. Um, I'm gonna have you jump maybe to the right a little bit um, because something else, the, the next set of boxes over here, um, something else to kind of think about and discuss is if you want to kind of pivot the focus of the current working group um, to, write, to writing the recommendations you know, after the September meeting, not for this month, um, or if you prefer to create a new working group for this um, or some other option, in which case, please add a sticky to that. Um, and then finally, back on the left where we had the volunteer um, options, if you have any other kind of questions or comments about the process, uh, please feel free to include those here. But I think we'd really like to um, encourage some discussion um, amongst yourselves about how you guys want this process to look um, for the next handful of minutes. Uh, so I'm gonna open it up for discussion and questions um, as, you, as you would like. I'm gonna, this is Jess, I'm gonna jump in and uh, let folks know that um, I am going to create a writing guide um, <clears throat> uh, focusing just kind of on general report writing and um, accessibility, because uh, the more accessibility work we can do as we're writing this, the less work uh, there's going to be for us on the back end having to, <clears throat> you know, redo things and recreate things. Um, and as for, you know, like the work group or creating new groups, folks will be absolutely able to work in small groups, you know, as long as we're not hitting quorum, if, you know, three folks want to get together to work on a session, you're more than welcome to do that. 
if you need help setting it up or anything like that, uh, Mad can help out. Um, uh, just, you know, reach out to me and I'll, I'll work with you on that. Adam, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Caroline, you're a great writer and I've really enjoyed reading all of your reports. Will you be involved in the writing process? Yes, I will. To the extent um, that I'll kind of help you guys solidify your thoughts, right? It's not, it's not my report, it's yours, but yes, yep. I will be involved in this process. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. So um, we're looking at a a first draft by mid-September, is that where we're at? Or? I would say probably just kind of these, at least getting the ball rolling on the high level recommendations. I, I wouldn't expect everything to be filled in, but at least narrowing down the subsections and getting our thoughts clear. And Jessica and Caroline, it looks like um, activity on the mural is starting to slow down in this section. So if we want to give it maybe another 30 seconds or so, then Jessica, whenever you're ready, we can move to the next and last agenda item. Yeah, I think we should probably take a break before and then maybe we can come back and close out with the education piece. Very good. Tenement break, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, um, are others also like working right now to think of like other working group options? Or... We teed that up yet. Oh, Caroline, did you wanna explain what's what you're thinking is behind this area that's being shown on the screen right now? I did go over it briefly. I think everyone was focused on the writing, um, yeah. their names to volunteer. But again, if you if you have thoughts about how you want kind of outside of who is involved, how you want the process to go. Do you want the same working group to change their focus? Do you want the same working group to continue and then form a new group separately for writing? Or do you have some other option? Um, and again, the mural stays open, you know, as long as you need it open. So if you have thoughts that come up later this week, you know, you can, you can go in and add those as well. Totally fine to come on camera and, and just ask for clarification on that last bit of weighing in everyone on the work group options. Don't want to confuse anybody. And this is Stacy. I'm not seeing a whole lot of activity here, so I just want to check in again. Is are we, have we confused members on what we're asking for in terms of work group options? Would you like Caroline to go through those options more, one more time, or maybe you're agnostic and you just don't have an opinion? Just not sure. I'm wondering if um, uh, Paula might have some thoughts as the working group chair because our working groups have kind of turned into pretty just broad like we just have the two working groups covering all topics with some mixed engagement um, and so maybe it's more of like what is the content that we're focusing on in our two monthly meetings and if folks have thoughts that they can put in that kind of other category with some sticky notes or something Paula do you have any thoughts about the logistics of the working group moving forward yeah, I like the idea of um, pivoting it. Um, I mean, it might be focusing on subjects that we need to discuss, but also focusing on writing and 
and kind of agreeing to do some work mm -hmm. outside the work group. But I, I, I think the idea of adding another group will be difficult. That's mm -hmm. my sense. I think we're all kind of feeling like we're giving it all we got. So I, I would go with the pivot. All right, other thoughts? Otherwise we can take a 10 minute break. Like Adam's got his hand up. Adam. Yeah, I, I agree with Paula and Ari put a comment in there. Um, I think that in order to get this done, we're going to need to change the working group from a working group to a writing group to at least organize our thoughts to come up with an outline with a plan. I don't know how else we'll be able to do it. I like that. It's like, you know, tracking down data and statistics that we need and Any other thoughts before we take a little 10 minute break? I guess I just say that if there's anyone that isn't been, hasn't been participating in the working group, but has interest in this part, please join and start participating. That would be great. Okay, um, so let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at uh, 12 p.m. Uh, to resume the discussion and we'll talk about uh, what our potential education plan for the public could look like. All right, so we'll see you back here at noon. Everyone can hear my voice. This is Jessica, just uh, pinging folks. We got about two minutes left of the break and then we'll come back and talk about public education. Thanks. And Jessica, it looks like uh, we're at noon. Yes, Would you like me to go ahead and kick this one off? Sure, thanks. So I summoned everybody to a, a question area on mural. It's been a while since we've talked about this element of the charge from the legislature on um, public education. Uh, and the exact language in the charge says, educate the public on recommendations made to the legislature and others about necessary and appropriate actions related to the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. <coughs> so we wanted to spend a little bit more time today talking about what that might mean. How should we be interpreting it as a task force? Uh, and so I've created a box uh, for some space for you to put your thoughts about what this might mean. How do we interpret it here? So know that that's here in the bottom right-hand corner of your, your screen. Um, it may be interesting to hear from those that were involved in drafting the legislation to begin with, what their thoughts were. And it may also be interesting uh, just to get your brains um, cooking a little bit to look at some ideas that uh, Jessica had pulled together um, uh, just to stimulate your thinking here on this slide. Uh, and so perhaps what we could do um, is to, um, Jessica, do you want to just briefly touch on why you were thinking the way you were for this public education? Like what's the genesis for the ideas that are here on the screen? And yep. then uh, Andy, I don't know if you want to weigh in on what was the initial thinking about this element of the charge. And then we can all go back to that spot. I just wanted to get you get the juices flowing and then we can do some brainstorming down in that open box. So Jessica, what, what were you thinking about here? Yeah, thanks Stacy. So mm -hmm. mine was kind of thinking higher, higher level around different stakeholders in the field that I've talked to and just seeing that the, the lack of education exists across the board, regardless of what industry or field they're from. Um, so just kind of thinking about a general funding education campaign that might be driven by community organizations. I, I run one of these organizations and a lot of what I do is education oh. public about psychedelics. And so I see kind of an avenue for that, not to like promote my own stuff, but I feel like that could be good to like 
community education for the community by the community. And then there's first responder training. I know they're doing this in Denver, um, where they're specifically trying to train, you know, law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs, and other um, people that are kind of the first to encounter somebody that might be having a bad experience on a psychedelic medicine. Um, it's kind of akin to like trauma informed care. So they're doing this in Denver to help people understand how to respond to some of these situations um, where people are intoxicated on psychedelics. Legal education, I feel like, is very useful. I've been finding it very useful. I feel like a lot of people just don't understand what's legal and what's not when it comes to psychedelics, especially with all the hype and things like that. Um, understanding more about religious protections, because there's a lot of churches popping up. Um, I see a lot of education that's needed, mostly for clinicians. I find, I've been noticing a lot of clinicians don't know a lot about this topic, but have very strong opinions, especially physicians around this. So I think a lot more education needs to happen in kind of the like public service sector and healthcare professions, um, as well as education on the culture and history of psychedelic medicines, including indigenous uses, community use and religious use. So there's just some of the ideas I'm thinking of based on the encounters that I have with various people from various backgrounds. Um, but I'm just one person. So, you know, I want to make sure others have some ideas about what they're seeing in terms of what are some educational needs. And of course, it's it would be important to hear what Rep Smith has to say about kind of the legislative intent of this duty. Yeah, Rep Smith, do you want to uh, weigh in here and what that original thinking was? Sure. Let me apologize for my change of place. I'm at my other job now. So uh, if you hear retail things happen in the background, it's just a bookstore. Um, so there's several ways to answer this question. I mean, the obvious uh, first sort of presupposition to say is that policy never goes anywhere without public support. And I think cannabis is a very obvious example of that. We saw the slow change over years from a really dangerous substance that, or you know, the majority of people thought was very dangerous to, oh, there's some medical use. And then, you know, as people's minds change, they said this you know, this isn't something that would be super dangerous if we have responsible use, just generally recreational. Um, that obviously also had decades of sort of counter-programming that we thankfully don't really have with psychedelics. We have a little bit of it, but not quite the same extent. Um, as far as like legislation, one of the reasons we have such a broad base of expertise and communities represented here is in the hopes that as representatives who now know probably some of the most knowledgeable in your field about this, that you would be doing public education just in everyday life and discussions. Um, and that's you know, part of the work of a task force is also to, to bring people together to continue that. I would obviously love for that to continue to be the case. Uh, the more people that know the potential um, positive impacts these substances can have, the easier it will be to have discussions um, in the legislature, as well as, you know, I'm out knocking doors right now, it's election season. Um, and uh, also trying to cut through uh, the, the partisanship of the day, which is why we have people in um, this committee from each party, or, or we at least the legislation crafted that way. So I don't know if I have much more to add, except that, of course, more public education is really necessary. Um, but also at the same time, from a state level, you know, we don't want to put hands on the scale. And in many ways, it's outside of uh, the government purview until it is legal or until we have a program to really, um, you know, push as hard as we might. And that's obviously, you know, it's a little bit of a chicken egg situation there. But um, yeah, underscore that public education from each of us is really important going forward. Thanks, Andy. Adam, I think I saw you pop on camera. Were you wanting to share something or just wanting to re-engage in the, the group? No, I, I was late coming back from break, so oh. I turned on my okay. camera. Because, so sorry about that. No, no worries. I just want to make sure you had uh, had the floor if you, if you were looking for that. Are there any other <laughs> general set the stage in terms of framing up what is meant by this part of the charge that anybody would like to weigh in on. Maybe, uh -huh. I, sorry, Stacey, I had just oh, one more yeah, thought ahead, as, I, mm -hmm. as you asked that question. Um, just generally, I will say, since I mentioned, you know, groups of this, um, this task force are really important here. If anyone would ever, it would be helpful to have me up here somewhere or help, in, you know, as a representative who's interested in this, in your communities to talk about this, it's an open invitation. Please feel free to reach out to my uh, email address. I anytime we're able to do that around the state is really exciting. So maybe just to add that as well, that I'm uh, also willing to do that work if it is helpful in your communities. Thanks, Andy. 
So I've grabbed your screens and brought you back to the box uh, where we can do some freeform brainstorming again as members. We'd like you to go ahead and pop in your thoughts about what would that education look like? Whether you wanna build on that list that um, Jessica populated or wanna riff in a completely different direction. Let's just see where we're at here. And then we'll bring this around for more conversation once we've seen kind of how things are being interpreted uh, at a future meeting. The members, once you've finished writing your sticky, if you want to go ahead and help us out by making them bigger, dragging on a corner of the sticky so that those that are observing the meeting can see them a little bit easier, that'd be great. We'd appreciate it. And I'm assuming that those stickies with just one or two word answers like licensing boards or youth, what you're saying there is you want to have maybe more targeted educational efforts that are reaching out to those, or is there some unique angle that you're wanting to drive at? So if you can help us understand a little bit more, I'd appreciate it. And if you finish sharing your thoughts, if you see something that was posted that you have a follow-up question on or want a little bit more information, feel free to come on mic and ask your question. And Jessica, I think I'll maybe call on you if you've got any observations that you're seeing here in summary how are you synthesizing this, particularly since you had come up with that helpful first blush list of ideas? What are you seeing here that might build on it or just take you in a direction you hadn't considered? Yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely like the youth, that's helpful. I've heard a lot of similar education programs that kind of relate it to like sex education, of, like mm -hmm. drug education in high schools. Um, which is obviously super controversial, but it's like they're going to do it anyway, give them the correct information. They can do it safely. I've kind of <laughs> seen it in that vein. So I can see that kind of as a youth education program at high schools or something. Um, I think like these community-led education initiatives. Um, yeah. Leveraging existing infrastructure, this fireside project, this is like a, you know, chat support line, kind of like the crisis intervention, like the suicide mm -hmm. hotline for people having a bad, bad trip. I'm sort of like that. I'm unclear about the licensing board one. Um, I mean, we definitely need to talk to them. I'm just not sure if it's just asking for mission or we need to have a, like a tailored educational mm -hmm. campaign for the licensing boards. I'd be curious what kind of questions they have. Um, I think with that one, it might be good to talk to what they did in Colorado because I know in Oregon, they just didn't even talk to the licensing board. And in Colorado, they got prior approval before they enacted anything. Um, yeah. That one's kind of tricky. Who here? Well, has... was... Go ahead, Jessica. I was just wondering if any, who... I'm not a licensed person, so I'm wondering what what are folks' kind of perceptions of their interactions with their licensing boards on this issue and kind of bridging that topic and getting that ball rolling. Well, and I'm wondering, Jill, if you've got a, if you want to weigh in on that one or have some perspective. Hi, yeah, I wasn't the one that listed that, but I would agree. Mm -hmm. I, but I, as I've mentioned before, too, I, this has. Um, significant implications to those boards. So I'm assuming that kind of the thought was pulling them into the, the loop and educating them as, as well. Um, uh, obviously like me, they'll have, they'll come at it with a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of education that needs to occur mm -hmm. there. Oh. Do you have any sense on like, like an approach for that if, maybe a default would be no we're not going to approve this for dual licensure versus like what would help bring them along to grant something like that i think your outline um you know in putting this report together is extremely valuable i think it's um covers a lot of what they would 
be interested in learning about. Um, again, depending upon the health licensing board, they may or may not be a healthcare professional themselves, um, at least for the, the ED. So any and all education like that would be very helpful. Just that document alone that's being provided to the legislators, I would get that into the hands of the health licensing board sooner rather than later so that they are not, if their board happens to be involved with the legislation that's passing and has some impact on their board that they're not going to be that that barrier again um, if, if they don't need to be. Mm -hmm. Margaret, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, um, that wasn't my comment either, but as a person who is licensed, um, my interpretation of my board is they're the ones that are going to receive complaints about a provider, right? Yep. And their job is to evaluate whether that clinician is doing something right or wrong, right? So they, so the full report that we write will be amazing for them, but almost like a cliff notes, like here are the parameters around what is good clinical care or however we want to word that um, about what these sub when these substances are being used in the right way um, and how they evaluate whether a provider is um, doing something um, out of scope. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I will tell you the, the Board of Medical Practice is uh, uh, entirely a complaint-driven board. It's just the, the nature of the beast. Yeah. And so that will impact them um, in a significant way um, in terms of financial and resources, et cetera. So, yeah. <coughs> well, thank you everyone for your input on this. We'll step away with the, the raw materials and see if we can develop it in something with some more coherent whole to it. And it'll come back to you uh, at a later date in the, boy, not so distant future. Uh, and with that, Jessica, unless there's anything else you wanted to dig into here with public education, that piece of requirement, we could pivot to um, just a few final wrap up details and then adjourn the meeting. Yeah, I think unless there's anyone else that wants to chime in and say something, I think we've got a good amount of information to work from <laughs> to talk about. So does anyone else have anything they wanna add or discuss before we adjourn? Yeah, Margaret. I think just adding to that provider piece, um, not only whether or not they're evaluating if a provider is doing something right or wrong, but also providers themselves can lose their license for engaging in those substances for themselves personally, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and just like Jill was talking about, it's complaint driven, right? So if there is a provider who uses a substance and then is, you know, basically gets their license removed, um, it, those are just some of the finer points around educating boards, right? Because that's what the boards are looking for. Are providers in the right or wrong in terms of their treatment? Or are those providers able to even have a license for, you know, given their own mental health or state? Yeah, thanks, Cor uh, Margaret. Courtney? Um, additionally, they're approving the continued education credit. So for the training programs that currently exist, we're submitting them to our boards and they decide whether or not they fulfill the requirements. So that's another piece of it as well. Yeah, that's an important point you bring up. And I'm wondering if that's a way to kind of get a sense of, you know, if there's a board that is consistently granting continuing education credits for this topic, then maybe they will be a little bit more open-minded about clinicians with dual licensure, what do you think? Courtney, yeah. Um, well, I can say that I've, I'll, I'll be fi finding that out here soon. And so I can kind of report back about that, whether or not um, the program I've completed will be um, approved or not. All right, any other final thoughts before we adjourn? Right. <laughs>
hearing none. Um, just want to thank everyone for all of your engagement um, with this meeting, and we're we're getting close. We've got we've gotten a lot a lot of work done. I know there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but I I have faith and confidence that we'll we'll be able to do all of it. And I'm really excited at the work we're doing, and and it's great to see how far we've come since November. Um, so with that, I just want to remind folks that we have our two working group meetings this month. The first one will be on Thursday of this week. And then uh, the following the fourth Thursday, I'm spacing on the date, uh, but two weeks from this Thursday will be the second working group meeting. Uh, well, hopefully we'll do a bunch of work. Uh, yeah, Bennett. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to get my hand in for um, after you're, you're done. Um, oh, right yeah. Sometime just that we have the working group meetings um, and then we'll kind of be doing additional things as needed. That's what ad hoc means. Um, so um, we'll just be pinging people maybe for data or whatnot uh, throughout the process and, and asking the folks that uh, volunteered to write to maybe chime in a little bit. Um, and with that, I just want to thank all the members and the observers uh, for watching. And I'll turn it over to Bennett uh, for his closing piece. Um can we get some clarification on uh, when the task force members should expect the formal voting questions to be uh, circulated? I, I think we've talked about that already, but I thought that would be a good note to end on um, to make sure that that expectation is set. Yeah, great question. I'm planning to send those out um, after we have a working group meeting so we can kind of discuss bringing that together um, and having that so that hopefully all you guys have the better part of a month to discuss it with your state agencies or communities. Okay, and j just to be sure that I'm clear on it, that means that we should be expected and ready to vote by next, at next task force uh, in early September. Correct. Everyone will be getting, given these one pagers for each recommendation that will be put to a formal vote. <laughs> like all the fireworks that are going off now. That uh, but happens to me all the time and I don't know why. I think it's an AI thing. Like if you hold your hand up long enough, it'll just raise the hand for you. Um, I'm wondering because you clapped. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, so so we'll be sending out the one pager for each recommendation question and sort of what are the things that you're officially having to vote on so you can take those to your agencies along with all the context and background of what is informing that question and that recommendation to be voted on. And so you'll only be given the ones that you'll have to explicitly vote on. Does that make sense? All right, I guess we'll adjourn for now. Thank you all so much for attending and participating. And I look forward to talking more about this over the next month and at the next task force meeting.